In accordance with the governor's executive order 202.1, and until further notice, all of the board's meetings will be held remotely by a video <coughs> conference. So we ask the public continually to check the town's website for updates and new information. Bill, can you do a roll call, please? Sure. Chair LaFaro? Present. Vice Chair Finnerty? Present. Secretary, Mark. Secretary, Mark. Secretary Mark. is here. Uh, Mr. Bellaney? Present. And Glorian Burke? Present. And we are missing John Zuccarelli and Robin Long, but we do have a quorum. Great. Can we join in for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America, of America. and, to, and the to the Republic for which it stands, which stands one, one nation, nation under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible with, liberty, with liberty and justice, justice for, all. for all. Thank you. Any minutes, Phil? Uh, not this week. Okay. Um, we have uh, the agenda posted on the town's website, and just for everyone's information, there is a link on the chat, on this Zoom chat, to the YouTube. So if you choose to watch it, you can simply click on that link. The town's planning staff, as well as applicants and their representatives, will be participating via Zoom webinar, which is being moderated by CTV. Charles Certain will be muting and holding the speakers in a virtual waiting room until it's their time to give testimony before the board. A reminder that applicants and their agents should state their name and address for the record. As is typical, there are no public comments allowed during the daytime meetings. The link to participate in, no, this is probably not true, right? But go to Zoom and go to the link that's listed in the chat and you can go right to YouTube and watch the proceedings. Finally, in accordance with the governor's order, this meeting will be recorded and transcribed at a later date and will be made available to the public. We are having some technical problems, so at any point, we might be able to, uh, this, we could go down, but hopefully not until we get the agenda completed. <laughs> so the first thing on the agenda is the planning board meeting dates. Claire, did you want to put those up? I think we, uh, um, I think we hmm. sent them out. Oh, we sent them out individually. I don't think we have them in the packet. Okay. The only aberration of the entire schedule is November, where we have one meeting. It's November 18th. It's day and night. Um, and that's because of all the holidays that surround it. So there's one meeting in November, two every other month. Um, I did not get them. I hope that's not a sign. I did not either. <laughs> so yeah, the only aberration is that it's always the second and, and fourth. Second, second and fourth Thursday. December, December is usually the second and third, and there's only one public hearing in December. But for <laughs> November, because there's uh, Veterans Day on the 11th, and then Thanksgiving, we have to have just one meeting, um, both day and night on the 18th. If you, we come up to it and we're jammed up, we can make a special meeting, obviously. So, but we'll, you know, we'll try to plan everything accordingly. Claire, can you have that list sent out yes. to the planning board? Because some of the dates don't have an evening session at times. Correct. So we, we know what the schedule is. Thank we're gonna resend it out to you today. Okay. Okay. Um, well, when the internet's back up. Yeah. Can I, can I have a motion to accept the uh, agenda for 2021? Motion. Motion by Gloria and second by Dennis. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Extensions, uh, five in favor, two are absent. So we're going to take the, um, the Dockers application first uh, on the agenda so that we can proceed with that. And that is on the regular agenda. It was um, under Secra at 17, it's 94 Dune Road Holdings Corp. And it's the, um, the scoping document. So Anthony, it's all yours. Okay. I'm gonna put it up, yeah, okay. Good, it's up, right? Yep, it's up. Okay, good. Um, so I, uh, Charles, I believe um, John Bennett should be here. Um, Kim Gennaro, I believe, also. Um, I don't know if anybody else. Okay. Um. 
daily locking. Okay. Okay, they're in there? Yep. Okay. Um, so everybody knows um, the project, um, which is the Docker site uh, in East Quag um, on Dune Road. Um, there was a ZBA application that was submitted for a change of non-conforming use, the existing restaurant and marina, uh, non-conforming uses in the R80 zoning district. Um, they are now before the board um, to redevelop the property with 25 condominium units and associated accessory improvements. Um, the zoning board went through the secret process. The planning board established itself as lead agency and issued a positive declaration, uh, thus requiring the preparation of a draft environmental impact statement. Um, and the first part of that was the adoption of a scoping document, a draft of which was submitted by the applicant. Uh, it was forwarded to all the board members. Uh, we had a scoping session, a public hearing on it. Uh, was made available to the public. Uh, we received uh, some comments um, from the Conservation Board. We received comments from the group from the South Fork uh, and some comments from the Planning Board. Uh, I've taken that. I have reviewed the document and I prepared uh, what is now a draft final scope. Um, and I'm going to go through the uh, report um, with the board now. Um, and let me just make sure here. And so basically, uh, just so you know, I took the, the document that was submitted by the applicant. Um, I basically kept uh, a lot of what they uh, said in there. I've expanded um, the discussions as it relates to the content of the DEIS. I, I, I added the whole section on the pause uh, deck information uh, and I reformatted it um, to sort of coincide with the scoping requirements um, so those are really just some of the general changes I made. Uh, the first part of this is the uh, introduction. Uh, the introduction is basically just describes uh, how we got to this point, uh, when the applications came in, um, uh, the dates by which lead agency uh, was established and when a positive declaration uh, was issued, um, the documents that we reviewed um, as part of that, all the uh, environmental assessment forms, application materials and such. And all of this, by the way, was outlined in the pause, pause deck that was written, so that's on record. Um, the introduction also outlines uh, the, uh, uh, the content of the scope, um, which includes a description of the action, the significant impacts, um, the extent and quality of the information uh, needed in the DEIS, uh, an initial identification of mit mitigation measures, uh, reasonable, reasonable alternatives, um, identification of information or data uh, that should be included in the appendices, uh, and a brief description of prominent issues, if any, uh, that were considered uh, and then deemed not to be environmentally significant or adequately addressed. Um, so those are, you know, basically the content of the scope. So the first part, and I broke this down into sections, uh, was a description of the proposed project. Um, this, again, basically comes from the applicant's narrative, uh, and it describes the project, um, basically what's being proposed, the 25 units, um, the demolition of the existing structures, uh, the number of bedrooms in each of the units, uh, the site amenities, um, the upland area, which is about 3.3 acres, um, the property is 8.6, 3.3 uh, of it an upland area. Um, it describes the general footprint of the project uh, and the decrease in the amount of ultimate uh, site improvements, uh, the parking on the property um, with 50 spaces in the garages, uh, 26 uh, accommodated in the driveways, uh, then two dedicated on three parking spots, uh, which I believe are shown to be on Dune Road. Um, the parking requirement breakdown is included in the description um, the groundwater management zone from the health department uh, indicates that the allowable flow rate is 1,980 gallons per day. However, the sanitary discharge expected from the 25 units is 7,500 gallons per day, uh, thereby uh, necessitating the need for a sewage treatment plant. Um, talks about the uh, accommodation of drainage on site. 
um, as well as compliance with the flood requirements in the flood zone. Uh, it also describes the permits that are being required for this project from other agencies, uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals, Planning Board, uh, the Building Department, uh, the Water Authority, uh, Health Department, uh, the Suffolk County Planning Commission upon referral, uh, the Department of State, who does a coastal concurrence determination, um, the DEC, obviously, for both the wetlands permit uh, and the speedies permit for the stormwater discharge, uh, and PSEG uh, for the uh, connection for the utilities. Um, also, um, any activities uh, that would involve the bulkhead and docks, uh, including any dredging, um, which I believe the applicant said aren't proposed right now. Uh, but if anything uh, does need to happen in that area, then approvals from the trustees uh, and the Army Corps would also be required. Uh, the next section of the report uh, talks about the uh, potential significant uh, adverse impacts. Uh, and this uh, we went through uh, in detail. I'm going to go through it, but we did go through it in detail when we did the positive declaration. Um, so basically it explains um, the sections of the uh, CEQA law um, that pertains to identifying the potential adverse impacts. Uh, they've identified um, in the narrative of what we identified as in significant or potential significant impacts uh, yes, and they indicate that they will be identified yes. um, and any relevant issue yeah. uh, will be addressed. Um, yes. I was going to call you though because... Uh... Um, so the first one was the impacts on land. Obviously, we went through all this. The property is on a uh, barrier island, uh, obviously subject to uh, flooding uh, and uh, impacts associated with uh, storm breakthroughs. Um, it talks about uh, retreating um, from the Atlantic Ocean as a policy. Robin, uh, you can't get on? Um, hold on for just a sec. Okay. Charles? Charles? Excuse me, Anthony. No problem. I heard you. Can you get try to get Robin Long on? She, yes, I can. Okay, uh, uh, Charles is going to get you on. Okay. 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 Bye. Sorry, Anthony. That's okay. Um, again, it talks about uh, the density issue. Um, you know, uh, being excessive, perhaps, um, in in light of the fact that it doesn't comply with the underlying zoning. Uh, and requires a sewage treatment plant in order to accommodate the density for health department. Uh, the construction detailing and timing and the potential impacts associated with that. Um, and also the uh, impacts associated uh, with the land uses, uh, particularly on that side of Dune Road, uh, which is largely vacant land surrounding the property. Uh, impacts to surface water uh, waters. Uh, again, um, we went into some detail. Um, the intensity of development in light of the fact that the property is prone to flooding um, and ocean breakthroughs uh, during uh, nor'easters and uh, other storm events. Um, half the property is encumbered by uh, wetlands uh, and they don't comply mm -hmm. with wetland setbacks. Um, habit and climate, hat, uh, uh, climate change uh, and the potential impacts associated with uh, major storm events and increased uh, RL, RL, uh, flooding, RL, RL, uh, impacts associated okay. with the uh, failure of a sewage treatment plant in the event of flooding, a storm breakthrough, groundwater swell, uh, all of that. Um, the inability to meet the wetland setbacks, again, were discussed, as well as the potential impacts associated with the watering if the watering is necessary for construction, particularly with the pool, for example, um, what would the impacts be uh, given that the groundwater is very high there? Um, Anthony, can I just interrupt for a second? Robin's sure. having difficulty. Charles? Sure. Yes. Charles, can you send Robin uh, the link to R.L. Long? Wait, wait a minute. Don't, don't give out her information. Oh. <laughs> Jackie. Um, I can do it from my set my phone. Okay, Thank you. do it from your phone. Thanks. Yeah. Thank I you. just need hang. Okay. Forward. Um, what's the what's her email? <laughs> Charles doesn't want us to do that. Oh, okay. Don't give her email over there. I think I might. I think I might. Can, ask. I. 
You can put it in a private chat to her privately if you can. <clears throat> I found it. I, ha I had it in my phone. Okay. It's, okay. I just sent it. Good. Thank you. Sorry, Anthony. It's, That's okay. Uh, <laughs> it's technical it's problems. It's a technical day today. Sure so. is. Um, the impacts to groundwater, obviously, um, the outdated uh, uh, groundwater data that was provided. Um, it was also uh, a period of drought. Uh, so we need an analysis of the groundwater uh, issues um, with all of the uh, test hole data um, from various uh, places on the property over time to see the groundwater levels and if they change. Um, the fact that there's a drainage swell uh, five feet from the wetlands, um, potential impacts associated with that. Um, separation distance um, from the sewage treatment plant from the groundwater. Uh, again, the issue of the sewage treatment plant failing during a storm event. Uh, this ties in with flooding, uh, the impacts associated with the fact the properties in the FEMA flood zones uh, must demonstrate compliance of all of the project, obviously. Uh, with the FEMA flood zone requirements and the construction standards, um, the potential impacts to infrastructure, uh, including evacuation routes um, during a storm event, um, and inconsistency with the idea of strategic retreat from flood, uh, flood prone areas um, under federal guidelines, um, the uh, drainage capacity associated with the project and the potential impacts with that. Um, uh, the fact that the project, again, uh, this uh, idea of retreating um, and having no uh, impacts from the, on the, in the floodplain uh, pursuant to NOAA standards. So again, this all ties into the various water issues associated with the property. Uh, impacts to plants and animals. Um, the New York State Natural Heritage Program has identified uh, significant natural communities uh, and uh, in documented endangered species uh, at or near the site. So that needs to be addressed. Uh, and again, coastal ecosystems, the, uh, um, you know, in addition to the habitat benefits, uh, the other benefits associated with uh, protecting the coastal eco ecosystems, water filtration, um, uh, uh, you know, helping with flooding uh, and various things like that. So that, that was an issue that we raised. Uh, impacts on open space recreation and aesthetic resources. Um, it's a scenic road, uh, dune road uh, under the town code uh, and the potential impacts uh, 25 uh, condominium units uh, elevated uh, to meet FEMA flood standards. Um, that needs to be addressed as well. Uh, the property is very exposed. There's not a lot of vegetation there. Um, so the impacts visually um, need to be addressed. Um, Impacts on transportation, uh, again, as uh, John Bennett had said, it's a pretty standard uh, section of the uh, code. So we wanna know the impacts on 25 condominium units um, on a year round basis. Um, we know that uh, this issue of second home ownership has popped up, uh, but the planning board doesn't, you know, cannot can, you know, restrict that kind of residency. So we do it based on a year round uh, assumption. But impacts to health, again, the sewage treatment plant um, and the potential impacts with that, as well as uh, evacuation routes associated with storm event, uh, consistency with community plans, um, the town uh, coastal resources, resources and water protection plan um, talks about uh, land uses and densities and siting development as to not have any significant environmental impacts. Uh, so that needs to be addressed um, the affordable housing issue needs to be addressed. The, the project doesn't uh, indicate how it will comply with that mandate under the state and town code. Um, and again, the issue of bringing properties into compliance uh, with the underlying zoning. Remember, this is a change of zone application. I mean, a, a change of uh, one non-conforming use to another. Um, and that has a whole set of standards. Um, and so, uh, you know, we need an uh, analysis because the goal is to try to bring properties into compliance. This is two acre zoning, uh, how to 25 units uh, versus what would be permitted under zoning, uh, what would be the impacts of that density. Um, the visual um, impacts and consistency with community character. Uh, again, um, the issue of visual impacts uh, with the elevated condominium development. Um, the land uses um, on that side of the road, the north side, uh, it's all vacant. 
Um, I know that there's obviously two, two story structures on, on the south side and the ocean side, but um, the land use is surrounding the property, um, a much lower density. Um, and then at the time when we did the pause deck, uh, a potential issue was um, that there may be significant public out, uh, controversy regarding the uh, action. Uh, that hasn't been the case to date based on the hearings that we've had and contact with the planning department. But uh, when we did the, the positive declaration, uh, we, we identified the potential for public controversy. Um, the next section of the scope identifies the organization and the content of the DIS. So we went through the positive declaration, what led to the need for the DEIS. Um, the content of the DEIS is, uh, this is cookie cutter. Um, every single scope that you have ever seen has this exact outline. Um, it's re required under the, uh, the CEQRA law. Um, so this basically outlines uh, exactly uh, what sections of the DEIS need to be included uh, with the description of the action and all the necessary information. Uh, and then under the various uh, sections, natural resources, human environmental resources, and the various subsections, uh, they'll each identify the existing conditions, the potential impacts, and the proposed mitigation. Um, and that's, that's the standard requirement. Um, other required sections, um, again, uh, CEQRA accounts for in addition to the sections up here related to transportation, land use, topography, all that stuff. Uh, other uh, required sections of the DEIS include uh, construction-related impacts, cumulative impacts, uh, unavoidable adverse impacts, um, irretrievable and irreversible commitment to resources, uh, effects and use of the conservation energy resources, impact on public health uh, and growth inducing impacts. Uh, I revised this a little bit from what the applicant submitted um, and I'll, I'll go through it later because we outlined it in more detail. Um, so this was revised to include a few more sections that are accounted for under the law. Uh, alternatives, um, that need to be considered. I also revised this um, to include uh, a development per the current zoning uh, under the R80 zoning that wasn't included in the draft, uh, as well as a reduced density alternative, which wasn't included in the draft, uh, something other than a, a 25 unit development. Uh, the no action alternative uh, as standard that's required, um, the purchase of the subject property uh, per CPF uh, some or some other uh, preservation method um, that also came out of the recommendation from the group for the East End and the applicant included it. Um, so that's good. And then the redevelopment of the property for a private uh, yacht club. Um, that's also um, a good um, it, given the uh, improvements that are there uh, and then the use that was there, um, the potential to consider another um, use other than residential um, is, is okay to consider. So that, that was, that was okay. Um, then of course the references and dependencies. Uh, then the next section of the scope is the detailed um, requirements for the actual DEIS. Um, and this narrative here comes from the applicant. Um, the DEIS should include a statement and evaluation of potential significant adverse impacts at a level of detail that reflects the severity of the impacts and the reasonable likelihood of their occurrence. Uh, again, short and long-term impacts um, in accordance with the positive declaration that this board issued. Um, so the description of the proposed action, uh, again, now this outlines the detail that needs to be included. Um, and I'm not gonna go through all of this um, because it's very detailed, but again, the uh, background and history of the property, um, the project need objectives and benefits. Um, that need to be uh, outlined. Um, and I included in here um, as a revision uh, how the density of 25 dwelling units was determined to be appropriate for the site um, versus what was uh, permitted under current zoning. Um, any benefits to the community with the project, um, the project location and site conditions. Uh, again, this would include um, uh, all the appropriate zoning and land use information, the flood zone information, um, the, the site conditions as it relates to uh, NOAA um, uh, zones, uh, as a, you know, the slosh zone, for example, um, and 
they would utilize various federal, state, regional, and local mapping resources. Um, the East Quad GEIS, if there's anything applicable in there. Um, and then it tells you here the existing site conditions in terms of site survey, vegetation cover, uh, an environmental site assessment, uh, which is pretty standard, uh, and an environmental impact statement, uh, the project design and layout, and this will give a description of, uh, of the entire project, uh, not just a description of uh, you know, the site improvements um, landscaping and stuff like that, but the solid waste um, generation, the size and numbers uh, of the units, um, the grading program, the drainage program, uh, water supply and wasteline uh, and sewage treatment, health department regulations, uh, the design and effectiveness of the sanitary system, all the utilities, uh, compliance with dark sky re uh, requirements, uh, landscaping, um, again, uh, all aspects of the project. Uh, again, a, a description of the construction uh, and operations of the site, um, uh, uh, construction and post-construction. Uh, this will include material um, and amount of soil to be removed from site, uh, which was an issue raised by the Conservation Board, as well as the required permits and approvals, uh, including a narrative of the remaining secret steps uh, for the project. Uh, the DEIS then will include a section on natural environmental resources, uh, including uh, soils and topography. Um, again, they're going to identify and through test hole data, uh, soil borings, um, the, the conditions and constraints of the soils, corrective measures uh, to overcome any soil limitations, um, impacts uh, and mitigation. The this here is just more detailed. The the, the source of information, uh, the soil survey, topographic maps, uh, various studies. Um, it needs to include the site development plans, this construction schedule, uh, debris estimates, um, the erosion and sediment control plan, uh, cut and fill estimates, uh, topography, soil types and constraints, soil borings, uh, groundwater conditions. Um, the functionality of the sanitary system related to groundwater. Um, so you get the point there. Uh, water resources, again, this is going to go through um, the groundwater, uh, surface water issues pertaining to the sites, uh, any of the impacts associated with the project and the mitigation um, for those impacts. Um, more details relates to that. This includes uh, the source of the information, um, the USGS maps, the uh, groundwater contour maps, soil boring logs, uh, groundwater investigation data from local, state, and federal sources, um, agency um, studies and reports from the Suffolk County Water Authority, for example, uh, the town uh, studies and, and long range planning documents, uh, county, um, and the state as well. Uh, consultation with the Water Authority, um, the various other agency sources of information, uh, FEMA, NOAA, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, again, describe the existing groundwater conditions, the surface water conditions, the drainage conditions, um, and any trends, uh, existing surface water systems, um, and the receiving waters nearby, uh, water quality conditions and trends uh, in these areas, uh, again, uh, sea level and climate change uh, and the frequency of storms uh, increases uh, the impacts of flooding, uh, again, as it relates to infrastructure, uh, saltwater intrusion, uh, coastal erosion. Um, again, the vulnerability of the site to flooding as it's in the FEMA flood zones, um, the drainage issues, uh, any impacts on the surface water, um, elevation of the water table and any changes, um, direction of water flow, um, any impacts um, associated to that, um, sanitary discharge, wastewater treatment system issues uh, and conformance to regul regulatory requirements, uh, pollutant loadings, um, post-development stormwater uh, conditions uh, after the project is completed and of course, any mitigation for any of the impacts. Uh, the ecology section, uh, again, we're gonna be looking at the uh, flora, the fauna, 
uh, the native plants and animal species um, as the property, again, as we said earlier in the PAS deck, um, they'll, have to, uh, be, they'll have to consult with the New York State ha Heritage Program uh, as it relates to the uh, endangered habitats. Um, they'll have to do a field survey uh, and investigation um, to analyze the existing commun natural community, uh, map, classify, and rank them um, with respect to their importance. Uh, inventory document and map uh, any of the coastal wetland ecosystems and habitats uh, through aerial photography investigations uh, by a qualified biologist or ecologist uh, and inventory um, of the ecological resources uh, the technical data uh, methodology um, for determining um, again observed and expected um, inventory of flora and fauna um, the potential impacts associated with the project on any of these resources uh, and obviously any mitigation uh, to those impacts. Uh, the DAS also has the human resources section, um, starts off with land use uh, zoning and plans and the impacts uh, to that. So again, they're gonna be looking here um, at the uh, land use and zoning conditions that surround the subject property, they say within a thousand feet. Um, I think that that's okay. Um, they'll look at photographs and site conditions, uh, the prevailing zoning information, the dimensional standards, uh, the supplemental, supplementary guidelines uh, and standards of the zoning code, uh, the comprehensive town plan, um, the town's coastal resource and water protection plan, uh, the DOS coastal zone management program, uh, the NOAA um, slosh zone, uh, they said will be summarized and the impacts associated with that identified. Uh, the vulnerability and invasion from coastal storms, um, and then consistency with the Long Island Workforce Housing Act. Uh, so this identifies, again, the various sources of information and the analysis that's needed, um, the zoning uh, and land use patterns in the area, uh, the zoning that's applicable to the site. Uh, and I revise this to include a discussion of the non-conforming lot and uses provisions of the town code. Um, you know, as this is a non-conforming use, um, they should describe um, uh, the non-conforming use, the history of it, um, and uh, the standards under which uh, this project demonstrates uh, compliance with those provisions, uh, the various town and county land use plans uh, that have been identified in other sections of this report. Um, again, the, the town's coastal resource and water protection plan. Um, the discussion of uh, FEMA and federal um, land use standards, again, this issue of strategic retreat um, from storm and flood prone areas, as well as the discussion of the New York State buyout program uh, that was developed uh, after uh, Superstorm Sandy. Uh, compatibility with the surrounding land uses, uh, again, the affordable housing uh, provisions of the town code, uh, coastal zone policies that may apply to the property. Um, and any um, impacts, and then get, of course, any uh, mitigation to those impacts. Um, there's also the transportation section. Uh, again, um, it, the transportation issues were mostly related to um, obviously the trip generation and um, evacuation uh, issues uh, pertaining to a storm. I largely kept the applicant's narrative and just detailed it a little bit more. Um, they identified that they're going to do the traffic counts uh, at uh, Dune Road and Post Lane, uh, as well as Dune Road and Ponquak Bridge. Uh, Ponquak Bridge, uh, that makes sense to me. Um, and then I just identified the uh, with more detail uh, the specific analysis. Uh, they identified the standard resources that they're going to use. Um, I included adjusting the traffic volumes to reflect the season seasonal fluctuations. Uh, which we know will occur out, out here. Um, and that information should be uh, gathered from the DOT. Um, discussion of any other developments in the area that may affect the study intersections. I don't know of any off the top of my head, but um, that should be included. Uh, and traffic impacts uh, associated with construction during the summer season. Uh, the evacuation plans um, in the event of a major storm event. Uh, and um, the impact of creating two on three parking spaces uh, on Dune Road. Uh, impacts to community facilities and services. 
Again, this is pretty standard as this is a residential development. We would wanna know um, an analysis of the impacts on the resources, the facilities, uh, schools, uh, police, fire, ambulance, water, solid waste, energy, uh, parks and recreation. Um, a discussion of the those services that are available um, the anticipated demand associated with this project, um, consultation with the service providers, uh, and then as standard uh, with, with residential projects, um, uh, some type of fiscal uh, analysis that really includes um, projection of uh, taxes that would be generated uh, for this project versus uh, any of the alternatives uh, and any mitigation, if there were any impacts. Um, the visual aesthetic resources and community character section of the DEIS, again, um, describes uh, the impacts associated with uh, aesthetic resources and how they would be mitigated. So uh, we would want a visual uh, analysis to include photo simulations and other visual exhibits uh, to indicate what the expected uh, visual changes would be so that the public could assess them uh, and, and we could identify any impacts and potential mitigation. Um, a description of the um, area of scenic value, uh, including the lighting plan, um, the lighting conditions in the surrounding area. Um, again, it, it, the property is surrounded by um, a lot of nothing on the, the north side there. So I think lighting um, information is important. Uh, the regulations under the dark, dark sky requirements, uh, architectural floor plans, full color renderings, uh, site inspections, uh, and all the site development plans would be part of this. Uh, impacts to human health. Again, this was largely uh, limited to uh, potential associated with flooding and inundation as it relates to the impacts from the STP potential failure uh, and evacuation routes. So um, the applicant uh, has indicated that those would be addressed. Um, one of the things I added in here um, is that um, the property is in the FEMA flood zone. Um, it is unclear, and this could be hashed out obviously through the environmental review process um, about compliance with the FEMA flood standards, uh, whether or not the properties can receive um, flood insurance. Um, so I threw that in there because uh, that would be a good analysis to have. Um, they'll provide us with uh, an STP design report uh, and they'll analyze this town of Southampton evacuation zones locator tool. Um, in addition to those sections, the DEIS has the other sections uh, that we discussed briefly, uh, construction related impacts, uh, which we talked about, uh, cumulative impacts, uh, if there's any other projects that are being considered in the area, um, that would have to be looked at uh, adverse impacts that can't be avoided. Uh, so those are those short and uh, long-term impacts that uh, are anticipated to occur, but cannot be completely mitigated. Uh, irreversible and irretrievable commitment of uh, resources. Uh, that's a description of the natural and human resources, which uh, will be committed as a result of the uh, proposed project. Uh, a descript uh, an analysis of the effects and use of the conservation of energy resources. Uh, impacts on public health uh, in, a, in a much larger uh, sense um, than public than the health that we mentioned there as it relates to um, impacts related to the uh, owners of the development. It, would there be any larger uh, public health impacts for the project uh, and growth uh, inducing as, uh, aspects? Uh, does the project uh, or will the project have any other um, impacts associating to growth uh, in other areas. Um, so that, that's always a standard requirement. Um, the next section are the reasonable or alternatives to be considered. Uh, again, um, I just amended this a little bit from what the applicant provided. Uh, the no alternative, uh, no action alternative uh, standard, uh, just keep the property as it is. Uh, development per the current zoning uh, and all regulatory controls. Um, I, I put that in there um, because we shouldn't have an analysis of what's permitted under current zoning. Uh, a, a reduced all density alternative, uh, something less than 25 units. Uh, a town of Southampton purchase of the subject property. Um, so this is a preservation alternative. Uh, and then the redevelopment of the property for a private uh, yacht club. 
Um, and I guess this uh, is an existing marina um, and it says it's firm through a Supreme Court. Um, I'm not too familiar with the uh, this decision here, but nevertheless, um, a development as a private yacht club will be discussed in this as well. Uh, each alternative has to provide uh, qualitative and quantitative data um, and any impacts uh, associated with the project, uh, mitigation, um, a comparison, um, so we can analyze uh, these impacts uh, and these projects against what's being proposed by the applicant. Um, so that's just standard in the DEIS. Um, yep, that's what that describes. Um, the next section is an initial identific identification of mitigation measures. Um, you know, they indicated in their project um, and their plans show a wetlands restoration plan. Um, but we really didn't get into much other than that. A standard statement in a lot of scopes, um, if you've researched and look at them, uh, basically indicated that a DEIS analysis has not yet been conducted. So specific mitigation measures have not yet been developed. Um, so that's included in there. Um, we'll, we'll get into mitigation, obviously, when the impact statement is prepared. Uh, next session section is the appendices to accompany the company DEIS. Um, I listed them here. It's not meant to be an exhaustive list. Um, I don't know what the heck I was trying to say here, but um, this is going to be revised to say uh, the appendices uh, to be included in the draft EIS shall include the following. Um, and here's a list of the types of plans um, that would be included as an appendix, and there could be more, obviously. Um, and then this is just a statement uh, that the scope um, was developed in accordance with the provision of the secret law. Um, it's just a standard statement to put at the end of the scope. Uh, and then that's, that's the doc. Ooh, goodness. That's a document. So are you open to some comments from the board? I'm open to everything. Okay, I have one comment to make that I'm not sh quite sure that you covered in this and that okay. is the marina activities as they currently exist. Um, the, the docks, the boats, uh, will they be abandoned um, uh, with this project? Will they be augmented as a recreational uh, asset? Uh, and then the impact of them. Uh, that has to be included. Okay. Because it's part of the existing site. Everything else, I believe, is has really been covered. Um, when you list on page three the agencies that uh, are involved, did you want to include the Southampton Highway Department? Is that a sufficient agent because of the off, because of the on-road parking? Uh, sure, we could add something in there. Um, and the trustees as well, if we're looking at docks and marinas. Yeah, that's in there, uh, but I will say something about the town highway. And then I just further specify the as of right zoning as R80. Anybody else on the planning board? Question? Robin? Question. Oh, good, you're here. <laughs> I, I'm in, finally. Thank you, Charles. Um, on the transportation section. Yes. Does the, is Dune Road and Post Lane the other bridge that brings you from West Hampton west to Dune Road? Because I'm concerned that there is a, if you go west, of Dockers, there is another bridge that takes you to the mainland, that takes you over to West Hampton. Is the, are we doing counts? Because I see the Ponquag Bridge, which is the Easter bridge, Easterly Bridge. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Let's ask the applicant. And then um, if, the, if the board uh, wants, we could we can include the counts at that, that intersection as well. Yeah, because that's just there. It's And there will be a lot of people not going east, so go west, or coming from that westerly bridge. Okay. Yeah, the, the post lane bridge is clogged 
I mean, it's important to realize that um, oftentimes you can only go east because of the flooding situation. The area just, I'm sorry, you can only go west because east of that location is prone to consistent flooding. The road yeah. is, is not passable, I would say, a third of the year mm -hmm. at any given time. So it should be included, Robin. That's a good, good yes, so that should be included. Yeah, and I mean, that, that, that has to be taken into consideration for evacuation. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, Anthony, I haven't had a chance to digest everything yet. Uh, tell me what's to be demolished? Um, all the existing structures. Everything. Not, not, not the, my understanding is um, not, none of the bulkhead uh, marina associated uh, structures, but all the other existing structures are going to be demolished. That's not specified. That's not clear. Okay. okay. Yeah, we're, yeah, I wrote, yeah, we're gonna get that clarified as to whether or not uh, there's any activity with the marina. Can I go back to that that intersection, that westerly? I know that the easterly floods because I drowned my Mercedes easterly. So I did drown a car going east when I shouldn't have gone east. On that westerly, you have the bridge, which is a drawbridge, all right? Then you have a traffic circle and then it leads into West Hampton. That does tend to back up. I don't know how far up traffic counts should go because a lot of people will come through West Hampton to get to that location, to get to that bridge. So I'm, I'm not sure how uh, um, the manual counts, how far on that route. Cause I know, I think that is an uh, evacuation route also Dennis, if I'm correct. Yeah, That's there's three way. bridges west of this property, the Post Lane Bridge in Quag, the Beach Lane Bridge in West Hampton Beach, and the Jessup yeah. Lane Bridge, which is the one I think you're referring to, Robin. So I think uh, that we should have traffic counts at mm -hmm. all those in those. Right. Those three bridges. Yeah, the Post Lane, the Beach Lane, and the Jessup uh, yes. Bridge. Yeah, as well, you have the Pond Quag here. I yeah. just want to make sure we had all the other bridges too. Yeah, but if people are coming from the city, they're probably going to use one of the western bridges. They're not going yeah. to go all the way into Hampton Bay. That's, that's my go concern. back west. Yes, that's my concern. Yeah. My concern. Okay. Any other uh, addition? I have one other. One other. Yeah, go ahead, Rob. Question um, on the charts, and I'm sorry, I'm looking for the page of the charts. I am very concerned that we have an order of how things have to be done and, and such and what the timelines are. Mm -hmm. I believe you had, Anthony, there was a wonderful chart that told the agency, yes, it's on page three, the agency and the permits and when the approvals are. Is there a way of doing a chart that gives us an order and the timeline on things, meaning that from the time, let's say the health department does their thing, how quickly the planning commission has to decide. We sometimes have confusion as to who goes when, how long we have in between. Is there any way of at least giving us? You know, it may be, um, yeah, I think in the description of the proposed project, um, you know, we, we could um, indicate that we would like um, to include uh, a description of the anticipated, you know, because obviously yeah. regulatory procedures, um, things happen, um, but, uh, you know, some type of anticipated process yes. of uh, application review mm -hmm. um, for this project. It would be very helpful because then we know what we're up against, that we've got only 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, we're waiting for the health department to come back, we're waiting for it to go to the planning commission, that has been always an issue of who goes, who's on first and how long till they can slide into second. Okay. And it would also be helpful to us, Anthony, this board, as to give us the regulatory time mm -hmm. frames that we have to deal with. For example, once this scope is adopted, what's the time for the draft DIS, you know, the various aspects of CEPR so that we know what we're dealing with. Okay and have sufficient time to review. My last question is, because this is a condominium, I believe 
that it, the proposal and the rules and regulations and the application to do the condominium has to be set or submitted to the state attorney general's office. Is that anywhere is here? The state attorney general's office review of this and the condominium and the private areas or um, the amenities, which the order that they're being approved, should the state attorney general be listed as a concerned you know, an agency, review agency? Um, they're not typically included, um, you know, as they don't issue approvals or permits um, for any of the construction activity. Uh, but you could certainly, in, in the description of the project, what the anticipated, um, uh, you know, because there's obviously going to be a homeowners association and such, uh, that uh, that component of the project, you, you could ask for it. I have found that if, if, the, if there is a completion, let's say, of the units where they're starting to submit CFOs and there are the amenities aren't done or a certain amount of completion isn't done, there can be a problem with the selling of the units from the sponsors with the state attorney general's office. So I would like to have in there some kind of knowledge of how they're proceeding in their submission of, of their rights as a condominium and with their amenities. Okay. Any other comments from the board? If not, um, I can't see who is here. So Bennett is here, John, and who else, Anthony? I thought Kim maybe, Gennaro, maybe. Maybe you can uh, take your uh, great. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, Kim Gennaro is here. For the applicant? Hi. Yes. Hi. Okay, Kim, it's... it's it, I, if I can just clarify one item that was up for discussion, there is no parking proposed on Dune Road. Okay. Arrow from PW Grocer. Okay. Uh, one down, 150 to go. <laughs> Any other comments, Kim? Oh, no, I don't. Oh, okay. I don't have any other comments. Thank you. Any other comments? I see two phone people here. Bailey, are you part of this? I am. I'm with uh, Bailey Larkin with Bennett and Reed offices at 212 and Nolene in Southampton. Um, Kim was uh, obviously in control of this document and has prepared it um, for the board's review and consideration. So any comments she had, I would I would just refer to her comments. Okay. okay. Well, if there are no more comments from uh, the applicant or from the planning board, I'll move to adopt the, sc uh, the scope. Motion. Motion by with, Dennis. Second. With the, uh, with the revisions that you guys requested. What? Excuse me? Revisions. With, with the revisions. The revisions, yes. 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 Adopt the scope with the revisions that That's we've passed. Motion by Dennis, second, second by Phil. Could you just please note for the record that I am here so that my yes, vote. Robin, Robin Long is here. Thank you. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstention? Six in favor, one absent. And Anthony, thank you. That thank was, you, Anthony. That was a, a, a giant road to hoe. <laughs> Good. It's very comprehensive. By the way, I think power's out in, I heard in Hampton Bays, which may be why Zuccarelli's not. I, uh, the website was, I'm in Hampton Bays also, and that's why I had a problem. The website is not coming up. The town website's not coming up. The portal is down. Yeah, the so portal. I'll, I'll repeat again that up in the chat, there is a link that will take you to the YouTube of these proceedings. So if you would like to listen, watch them, just go to the chat and click on that link. Portal, Madam Chair, I have been advised that working. the portal's back up. The portal's back up, oh good, yep. okay, great. Maybe What's somebody should tell John that the, somebody should call John and let him know because he might be ha have the same problem that I was having, let him know that the portal's back up. Well, he'll probably call in, he hasn't called in. Uh, yeah, but there, I mean, it's like there's no power, never mind the portal in some portions yeah. of the Hampton Bays. Well, 
Uh, Anthony, what is the time frame now for after this scope that we've adopted, revised scope? You are, well, now you're not under any time frames. Uh, now the applicant's going to go and prepare a scope. So, um, do they have a time frame? No. Um, but, but what I would say is this what I will do for the board is I will, I will prepare a memo and send it to you um, that outlines what the, the secret process is once we have a DEIS. Excellent. Thank you, Anthony. And thank you for a good document. You're welcome. Okay, we're going back to the agenda. And so we'll start with 200 North McGee Street. Matthew, that's you. Wait, can I just interrupt? We're going to do the town board matters first. Oh, sorry. Uh, number 15 and number 16. Number 15 okay. is going to be Dave Wilcox. He's going to okay. share it with you. Is David here? He is. Oh, good. Hi, David. He's going to unmute himself though first, I think. Okay, David. Okay, maybe not. Dave? His name's there, but. He must be there, right? He's, he's, he's been here. on and I've been texting him. So, um, and also he's on the phone also, one of those phone numbers. Oh, one of those phones, okay. It's him also, so hopefully we'll yeah. get him on. If not, we can jump to Mike, who is also on the phone. Mike, um, are you here? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, Mike, why don't we Hello? move to you? So we'll do yours first, okay. Mike, if that's okay. Uh, I can share yeah, the screen. No, uh, I can share the screen with his resolution, but maybe have Mike just reiterate first um, yeah. about the battery storage. Sure, just, and I apologize. There's obviously been some technical difficulties at Town Hall. I ran home so I could get on. Uh, speak with you all. So, uh, everyone can hear me okay? Yes, we yes. can. Great. Okay, so last time I was here, um, we had a brief introduction to battery storage. Um, we're revisiting that as well as uh, some of the comments that the planning board had, um, and specifically with regards to uh, battery storage being allowed in a basement. <laughs> and um, I don't know why I thought Dennis might be wrong, but it was an error on my part. So yeah. while New York State Building Code, um, they will be regulating where they are located in a home. Basements are allowed. They just need to be in a utility and or storage closet. And this was something that uh, there was some confusion on. So as long as it's in a utility and or storage closet, it can be located in various places in the home. But again, this will be re regulated by the uh, New York State Building Code. Including um, the basement, right? Including the basement. Including the basement. Okay, that was. Um, what about a linen closet? I'm being somewhat facetious, but not not. I'm sorry. I said, what about a linen closet? I mean, I'm I'm being somewhat facetious, <laughs> but can, can you put it in any closet, or is there some code that's going to say you need to have X, Y, or Z space or um, insulation or something like that? Gloria, I uh, actually. I looked into one of these with Tesla's last spring, and first of all, they do require a building permit. I was surprised because mine was intended to be in, down in my basement. There is space requirements. There's also, um, they require ventilation grills to allow for the free circulation of air. Um, so, uh, but they do make you, uh, well, I think part of their service would, they would secure a building permit from the appropriate municipality. Interesting. Um, that is correct. Quite large. And so we are, are attempting to fast track the building permit process, similar to what we did with the solar uh, systems, where we'll have a battery storage permit process um, that will act as a, uh, as a building permit. Um, but uh, it, there are various uh, guidelines that are within New York State Uniform Code and the Fire Code that uh, outlines the specificity of what is required in order to ensure it's a utility and or storage closet and some of it varies between the kind of models um, i don't have the specifics in front of me but i could get more information on that if you would like um, something just so we're all on the same page at following our meeting I, we did meet again with the town board and the town board um their mostly their concerns were in reference to the decommissioning and so i don't know if this is something i'd like you'd like me to go into as well um, but I, I am still here to take more comments and, uh, and I can dive into a little bit more about decommissioning. Um, but that's really where we're, we're staying currently. And then we're commencing secret and uh, hope to have, uh, we have a town board resolution on for the 22nd. 
of December. Uh, okay. Yes, for, okay. mm -hmm. we anticipate a notice of adoption sometime in the second meeting of January. Okay. Are there any other uh, comments that we want to make? Are we comfortable with this legislation as it's written? I don't think there are many planning issues. Yeah. I mean, I think we're relying <laughs> on, on, this, on the state um, to, to find a lot of it. The town is just trying to expedite the ability of us to put these in our homes, is my read. Yeah. So, uh, that, that's we'll, it. so we'll um, give a positive report. We need a vote on this. Yes, please. To adopt yep. the report. So do I have a motion, a motion to by Gloria and second by Phil, all in favor? Aye. Opposed abstention, six in favor, one absent. Okay, thank you. Thank you, guys. Oh, thank you. Do we have David now? Can you hear me? Hi, David, we can, yes. Okay, good. I was trying to do it on my phone, but <clears throat> my phone won't un unmute, so. Oh. So um, okay, let me share the screen. I have the uh, town board rezo. Can you all see that? No, nope. nope. we can't see you or the or the document. Yeah, you don't seem Hold to on. have a, a, a picture. Do you have a camera uh -huh. on your computer? Oh, I don't know. Duh. <laughs> Only 2020. That is a limiting factor. <laughs> <laughs> the voice of Charles. <laughs> I'm I'll lucky share, I'm I'll share the here. screen, David. I'll share the screen. Okay. Okay, Claire will do it. Having technical difficulties here. It's okay. Just give us an overview and it's up on the screen. Getting a, We've read it. Echo. Well, we don't hear the echo. So the um, basically what we have here is is the reenactment of the old Ag PDD, um, it, it, and the Ag PDD, as we know, was a zoning mechanism for farmland preservation. Uh, the the current proposal would rename the old Ag PD, PDDs as Agricultural Conservation Zoning District. And it also moves it to a different section of the zoning code. Um, it, it places it underneath the uh, section on ag overlay district. Since the public hearing notice, uh, and actually since the public hearing, there have been two revisions to the local law. And um, those were circulated to the town board members. And the, uh, the version that is up on the screen there has those two revisions. Um, I had them highlighted in the document that I was going to share on my screen, but th those two reference, uh, those two revisions basically are re a revision that uh, includes Article 49, Title Three of the Environmental Conservation Law that was added to 330-51.1 uh, C. I don't know, Claire, if you can, can you go just to that hold section, 330. 50, 51.1 right. C. All right. Okay. Um, there were some comments from the Ag Advisory Board that they would like to have a reference to the uh, environmental conservation law that also deals with conservation easements. The second revision was to the, change the time period for negotiating a sale of the development rights uh, or fee title purchased from the town. And that was changed to allow negotiation uh, for the term of the easement or for as long as the easement remains in effect. So the minimum term of these easements is 10 years. Uh, there is the ability to extend that term if that's the uh, term that's actually specified in the easement or the easement can be initiated uh, originally with a longer term than 10 years. Um, so just to highlight some of the uh, substances of, of the code, and let, let me point out that this code is word for word from the old Ag PDDs, with the exception of those two revisions that, that I just went over. 
Um, the, the old P Ag PDD code was simply moved into a new section of the zoning code. Uh, but just to highlight some of the provisions of the old code and, and the current provision, um, under this local law and under, under the this zoning provision for a new zoning district, which would be an agricultural conservation district, a farmer or a landowner may voluntarily enter into an agricultural easement that restricts the use of their property to agriculture as defined in 301 of Ag and Markets. Now I know, and I'm, I'll touch on the comments that I've received from the planning board after I go through this, but I know some of the board members have been concerned about uh, what Ag and Markets allows under agriculture. Right. Uh, yep. The farm that the property owner is applying for must be in the Ag Overlay District and it must be a minimum of 10 acres. The agricultural easement must remain in effect for a minimum of 10 years, but it can be greater if that's what the uh, applicant asks for, or it can be extended with agreement from the town board after the 10 year term. Uh, during the first 10 years of the agricultural easement, but not less than five years, the farmer can peti <laughs> petition for an early termination of the easement subject to a public hearing and a finding by the town board of an undue hardship or extraordinary circumstances. The ag easement uh, will specify the allowable development right yield of the property and the open space requirements that sh uh, should the property be developed during the term of the easement. And you can see on the screen there, the, uh, the local law specifies what the development yield is on a property and the percentage of required open space should the property be developed. And those percentages and uh, yield uh, factors are all based on the zoning of the property. Yeah, that's it, Claire. Um, and again, the, none of that changes from the old Ag PDD. Uh, these yield uh, calculations come out of uh, standard uh, development right yields based on the zoning of a property. And the open space requirements are also uh, also mirror what the uh, open space law currently requires for subdivisions. Um, during the term of the easement, the farmer can do the following. They can sell their development rights to the town, uh, either all of the rights or they can sell uh, portions of them over the term of the, of the easement. Uh, they can sell the development rights to another property owner and, and that property owner could transfer the rights <coughs> to their property for increased subdivision yield. They could sell the entire property to the town, fee title for the, for the property. Um, and I guess by the same token, retain the development rights that were removed from it. So if the town did buy fee title to the property, it would be reduced in value based on the development rights that the farmer still holds on to. Or that the farmer could sell the fee title to the property and the former uh, development rights that were lifted from the property. And finally, the, the property owner can apply for an approval of a conservation opportunity sub, subdivision to the planning board, subject to the yield and open space terms that were stated in the ag easement. If the town does not purchase the development rights or the fee title before the easement expires, the farmer may develop the property in accordance with the yield and the open space requirements of the easement. Uh, there had been some concern from the town board whether the town is mandated to purchase these development rights back from, from the property. And um, there is no mandate that they have to buy them. Uh, the town, the code does require the town to enter into negotiation if the property owner asks the town to consider a, a purchase, but the town is not obligated uh, to purchase them um, and is not obligated to purchase them at any uh, particular price. Uh, so there would be an appraisal and the town can make an offer based on that appraisal uh, and the, the landowner would have the option to reject that appraisal or not. Um, okay, just to get to some of the comments that I received from the planning board. Uh, so Jackie had emailed me and said that the New York State Ag and Markets regulations that permit horse farms and plant nurseries in ag districts um, should, should not be allowed under these easements. Um, and I think Dennis kind of mirrored the same comments. He said the easement secured should be elevated to the enhanced easement. Uh, the PLT, he believes, 
Uh, their easements preclude large structures such as riding arenas and stables, as well as nursery stock exceeding a certain height with an emphasis on traditional row crops or viticulture with the intent to preserve vital and important view sheds. Uh, Dennis also indicated that PDDs are discretionary. Uh, again, this is no longer a PDD. Um, this would be coming in under um, a, basically a change of zone application or a similar change of zone application. Granted, it still would be discretionary on the part of the town board, whether they want to enter into an ag uh, conservation district with the, with the property owner. So the, the discretionary uh, provision still remains. Uh, Dennis also felt that uh, the enhanced ag easement should be written into the local law so that there is no ambiguity as to what conditions would be mandated in the easement. And then I received comments from Glorian, who said she agreed that only land planted with row crops should be included. Um, so that's it for my presentation. If uh, we want to go into some discussion from the board member, I can take some notes in preparation of preparing a report to the town board. Um, you, all I, our comments, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Jack. Yeah, no, you'll include our comments. Um, you know, David, yes. we've, we've had issue with ags and market over the years because they consider horse farms and nurseries um, part of agriculture. And so if this law is intended to perpetuate and preserve uh, growing of food and row crops, there has to be some mechanism in there to, to restrict um, um, horse farms and nurseries. I mean, Dennis speaks about an enhanced easement, some mechanism whereby we can legally say, if you enter, if you are entering into this arrangement, you, you know, you have to, you have to grow food. Well, that, that uh, Jack, that mechanism is already in place and it's, it's been used, I think, twice already, maybe two or three times. In the him. PLT has, or the PLT actually goes out and renegotiates some of these older easements um, for compensation to further restrict the land. So my, our comments, maybe we should just direct the town board to those enhanced easements. It's already been done. The language is there. And the, the town has used those for several properties. Yeah, I, I know two in particular. Yeah, right? exactly. Two in particular I'm, I'm aware of. Yes, and the, the, the idea was that when this was originally in, in place, we thought that by, by having eggs and markets cover it, it was gonna stay in farmlands, but the value of land has gotten so crazy that people with a lot of money are willing to spend way more than a farmer could afford to buy and keep it with, as a horse farm. Or, you know, they like Madonna, with the, she has trees on the edge of her property. Um, so I think in today's world, it has to have an enhanced easement. I totally agree with, with, mm -hmm. with Dennis on this. Struggling. Well, I don't know if that was the original intent of the town board when they set up the ag PDDs. Um, they were concerned with just restricting the property to what's allowed under ag and markets and ag and markets allows horse farms. Well, um, that's, that's the big issue, David. Yeah. They're going to do this then they may have to modify the PDD and not just take the whole kit and well, It's not a PDD anymore. Don't, don't uh, so refer to ag, it as PDD. An ag, um, an ACD. It's an AC. ACD. ACD. So, so, so the ACD, just, it just, I mean, it needs to be modified because we've lived, we've had the experience of this mm -hmm. where what we want to do gets overridden by ags and markets. And uh, this has been going on for 25 years. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we've had no mechanism. So I think you need, need to really strongly say that the planning board feels strongly about that. I have two other questions. Oh. Okay. Have you done an inventory on how many 10 acre farms there are left? We have not done a recent inventory. I think it would be a smart thing to do. I'll put that in the report. And then my other question is, does if the farmer wants to sell his development rights, does the town have the first right of refusal? 
Uh, Kathleen, do you know if, if the town has the first uh, right of first refusal? I, 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 believe, that. I believe that's in there, yes. <laughs> After the law, but not, not under current under under current law there's there's no first right of refusal. Oh under this under the terms of this easement, Madam Chair, is yeah. that what you meant? Yeah, yeah. This new yeah. 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 Um, so this doesn't does does this change any of the terms of the existing PDDs that we had? No. So no. they're so they would if if the our suggestion about not using egg egg and market they would be grandfathered and anything new would not be? Absolutely, those are already, uh, the I believe there are six, Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, six existing. Yeah, yeah and those are signed agreements. You cannot change those terms um, unless at the end of the term they want to renegotiate. Right. So this would be moving forward. Okay, just, oh. just to be clear, thank yeah. you. I, think I, I, would, I would think it's important not to, that's a specifically, reference ag and markets that we're not going to embrace them. It's sort of, rather than going that route, let's let's focus on the enhanced easement, the mm -hmm. language that we want to execute and negotiate rather than looking to the state. And we all know the, the shortcomings of, of ag and markets. It doesn't- no, I totally agree with, I, which, but, I, I totally agree with you, Dennis. But an applicant, you know, an applicant comes in and then gets a letter from ags and market. You know, we had that on the horse farm. Mm -hmm. Well, no, because we didn't cut a good deal. We have to we have to get much better language in these easements. Exact, exactly. So, I mean, so I think, David, what we're also saying is that this ACD is not a hundred percent adoption of the old PDD, AG PDD. Yeah. But there are some modifications okay. that need to be based, made based on what we've learned um, over yeah. the last twenty years. Right. right. And uh, to answer your question, Madam Chair, um, in the current law, it does say at least four months prior to the termination of the ag easement, the town has the opportunity to purchase those development rights. Okay, so they have the first right. Okay. Yes. Good. Any other comments on this? Dave, you have our comments now? Yeah, I have the comments. Hopefully I'll be able to get into the town hall on Friday and prepare a report. Okay, do you think they'll I'll listen to us? I'll circulate it to you all. I hope they listen to us. <laughs> After we spend all this time. <laughs> They're not the ZBA. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Do we, do, I don't, do I need a motion on this? Yeah, or? we have to adopt this advisory report. Oh, right? we have to adopt I'm the advisory report. Moved by Dennis, second by Gloria, and all in favor. Aye. Opposed, Aye. abstentions. It is moved, uh, six in favor, one absent. Thank you, David. Thanks, David. It's good Thanks, to see David. you. It's You're good welcome. To hear you. <laughs> nice to hear you. <laughs> yes. Okay, now we can go back to the beginning. Back to the beginning. Back to our agenda. Jackie, aren't there two yeah. absences? Two what? Two people absent? No, just a Gorelli. No, just a Gorelli. Laney here? Because I'm not seeing. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, John. I didn't see you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry, there you are. Sorry. I, I don't think I would have done that, taken a vote if I didn't I'm know. I'm sorry. I, I just... Um, okay. Number two, 200 North McGee Street. Matthew, that's you. Yes, I will share the screen. And yeah. Is this note in the chat anything we should be paying attention to, Claire, about Ed Dearman, about Sag Harbor? You're muted, Claire. <laughs> muted. Um, just to let Ed know that Sag Harbor is not on the agenda today. Um, we set the agenda 10 days prior. He sent me some information today, okay. expecting oh. to be on. Are you so responding to okay. I did, but I don't think he heard it. So just, Ed, um, call me tomorrow at work. <laughs> I'll help you out. Thank you. Okay, Matthew. All right, number two, uh, number two 200 North McGee Street. Uh, this is a pre-application for a two-lot subdivision of an 87,000. Uh, square foot and change parcel in the R40 zoning district, uh, archaeological sensitive area. Um, as proposed, uh, let me just show you the map. Um, one lot in the back, one lot in the front. As you can see in the area, it seems to be a lot of stuff going on in the property. It's a new owner. Um, at this time, I'm recommending that we deem this incomplete, um, you know, in terms of access. I've spoke to Anthony and Kathleen on this. You know, as it's proposed, they have a 10-foot flagship to the rear lot. 
uh, and a 20 foot easement that goes over a third parcel that's not part of this map. Um, you know, I'm not really sure how the board would achieve that, you know, the offsite easement that doesn't exist yet. So you know, it's my recommendation that they either include this third lot as, as a third lot within the map or relocate the easement so it's fully within the proposed map as shown. Okay, um, so we're deeming it incomplete. Incomplete. Motion to deem this incomplete by Dennis and by Gloria. All in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? Abstention? Six in favor. One absent. Uh, Anthony Jet Cab. Yep. Anthony, I have a I have a question in the um, the write up. It's a one hundred and seventy three thousand two hundred twenty seven square foot parcel, one point seven one acres. The math doesn't work, I don't think. I think Anthony's frozen. Anthony? It's appropriate for today. He is frozen. <laughs> uh, frozen. Yeah, he's... Anthony is frozen. Shall we just jump over that for a sec? He's um, not frozen on my screen. Hold on one second. Frozen on my screen. Anybody else's? Yep. He's yeah. frozen on mine. Okay, let's go to Jackie uh, Fenland, JSC Resources. Uh, yes, um, I will share the screen. Give me one moment. Uh, this is the resolution. I am recommending it be deemed incomplete. Um, let me see here. And just to remind you guys, this is off of Sophia Court. So this was part of the Sophia Place subdivision. This was intentionally covenanted and left larger than the other parcels to allow for TDR uh, receiving area. So they are proposing to bring in two buy and barons credits to achieve a three lot plan. Um, let me see. So this is, this is actually the revegetation plan, but it's clearer to read. Um, so it was previously, I think, used for sign, sand like mining um, or, you know, fill. So um, they are proposing to revegetate this red area that you see here. And then the common driveway is over these three 10 foot flag strips. Um, but I did speak to the applicant's representative and they are aware that I had concerns about the map and they are going to work on that. So I just um, wanted incomplete. to yeah, recommend that it be deemed incomplete. Motion to deem this incomplete Motion. by Motion. Phil, second by Glorian. All in Aye. favor? Aye. Opposed abstention, six in favor, one absent. And Anthony is back, he said. I'm back. Yes. Very good. Jet I, Cab LLC. I don't, I don't know if you heard me um, when you've got frozen, but I was reading um, the, app, the, the information and um, it's saying it's a vacant 173,227 square foot parcel, 1.71 acres. Is okay. there a typo somewhere? Let me see here. Uh, yeah, there definitely could be. Yeah, there's a typo in there. Sorry about that. Well, uh, what, what is the typo? Uh, well, here, let me say <laughs> The property is... Maybe uh, 3.9. It's, oh, it's, it's four acres. It's four yeah. acres. So it's a four acre parcel. Yeah, okay. it's a four acre parcel. So anyway, you saw the aerial uh, two lot subdivision. We previously deemed it incomplete, uh, <laughs> waiting for a ZBA determination that this property was actually single and separate from this piece. Uh, it is, um, so it doesn't need to be included in the subdivision. Uh, so I'm just recommended that we deem the application complete and scheduled the hearing for January 28th. I have a motion. <clears throat> motion. Motion by Glorian, second by Dennis, all in favor? Aye. Both <clears throat> extension, six in favor, one absent. And then Going down, Claire. Can you here. let Kim Judd in, please? East Quag Mobile Home Park. Right, so this, this, go ahead. You sent us some information. Yeah. Bit, yeah. Yeah, so this was uh, two work sessions, the board saw this. Um, Did we really, what, what year? Last year, I think. A long time ago. <laughs> um, yeah, so this was the idea, and Kim's here. I'm going to just share the screen real quick. Uh, the idea was clear. Yes, but Kim. Can we let Richard Friedman in too? He's my client. Sure. Please, Thank Charles. You. Thank you. No problem. Um, I'll share the screen. I think, Kim, you left me a message that the number of units may have changed. Is there another plan then you have that you can forward to yeah, me? I, yeah, I actually emailed it to you a while ago, the PDF. You emailed me, but this is what I had is the one with the 43. 
I'll yeah. show you, I'll show the screen and let me know if, if maybe we just got the wrong plan. So this is the one I have. If you can see that it shows yep, the no, nope, not that one. Yeah, is is this yep. this is not it, right? No, I have mine up. I don't know if I can share mine. It's yeah. Uh, it's, well, it's try to try to share it, please. Okay. How do I do that? <laughs> <laughs> On the bottom it says share screen. My, I'm the twelve year old. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, I went stop video, mute my video, rename, add profile, add, or maybe it's at the bottom. It's the green button at the bottom. Oh, share screen. I'm sorry. There it is. You can see the map? Uh, yeah. Give us a second and Mike, uh, yeah. hopefully it'll happen. Takes a second to load. A couple of seconds. Is it on your desktop? Yep. I hit the share screen button again. Yeah, well, I can share it if you want. Okay, that's great. <laughs> I have it up. I don't know why it's not showing. Can, can you both this is identify, them, my can you identify yourselves, please, for the record? Kimberly Judd, 737 Roanoke Avenue, Riverhead, New York, for the applicant, and my client Richard Friedman of Third Garden Homes for uh, he's the 115 Haviland Road, Stamford, Connecticut. I'm the president of Garden Homes Management. We're the general partner. Um, so let me just share it. Do you see it? Not yet. Coming. It's, it's, coming. it's building. Yes. It it is. Got it. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, so give us an overview here, please. I'm sorry? Give us a, a bit of an overview to the yeah, board. So last year when we appeared before you as a work session, it was to relocate 42 of the mobile homes on the south side of the railroad tracks and they're the oldest homes in the park. Uh, since that time, my client uh, has reduced that number because of reasons that he can uh, share with you from 100, I'm sorry, from 42 units to 21 units. So there are 40 two units on the south side of the railroad tracks. And I don't know, Richard, if you can go to the, oh, there it is on section one, see where he has the handover? Yes. Okay, th there are 42 mobile home units. Our original plan was to relocate all 42 units over to where it says proposed development. But for financial reasons, he's, and because of existing leases that he has, he's unable to relocate all 42 mobile home units. And the proposal now is to relocate 21 mobile home units from section one over to the proposed development area. Right now he has four vacant pads in section one, which leaves 17 sites to be, to be bought out and replaced in the relocation area. I know when we appeared before the board the last time, uh, the site plans are valid for two years that we would have to come in every two years to extend the approval as we, as the client is able to uh, purchase homes on section one and move them out. The, uh, my client has received, has been notified by the New York State DEC in the County of Suffolk of grant funds for specifically targeted for mobile home project sites such as this one. And there is a grant that is available to my client through the County of Suffolk and New York State DEC uh, to connect all 21 homes in the relocation area to a innovative and alternative on-site wastewater treatment system. And maybe Richard, you can explain to them your conversation with the county in New York State? Um, the, uh, through DEC, the county um, uh, issued a grant uh, proposal, a not notice of availability of a grant about, um, now it must be about two years ago, for a mobile home park, specifically a mobile home park in, in Suffolk County to, um, to connect to an I to, to to connect to an IA system or to connect a portion of the community to an IA system, and the thinking of the county was that um, mobile home parks are um, are much simpler to connect at scale because the 
home sites are owned by one owner who can make the decision for all of the homes as opposed to say a condo association or certainly single family where the lots are much larger and the costs would be much higher. So, uh, so we applied, we were actually the only, we were the only ones to apply for the grant and it was awarded to us um, uh, again, it was about, I think it was about a year and a half ago. And uh, I was on the phone with Ken Ziegel yesterday. The grant has been um, extended to 2024 by the state and it will be used um, as to cover part of the construction costs for this relocation area um, so that we can build a, a sewer collection system and then we can uh, put in an IA system and the septic field that's gonna be required to uh, ultimately to uh, infiltrate the wastewater that comes out of that system. And can I just ask, uh, Mr. Friedman, you've used terms IA and other things, it's, it's not going to be a sewage treatment plant. What is it going to be? No, it's not going to be a plant. Um, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be an oversized IA system. Um, I, I can't claim to be an expert on this, but I have had fairly extensive discussions with Ken and uh, they, they exist to treat this number of homes and um, they, uh, they perform uh, about the same as an IA system would perform for a single family house in terms and of obviously the, the nitrogen county, reduction. The county Health Department would, would, would approve that. Correct. The County Health Department has to approve all of it. Well, first of all, they have to approve it, period. And they have to approve it uh, as part of the expenditure of the grant funds. Right. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure I, <clears throat> I understood exactly what, I mean, I think it's great. Um, I just I wanted to understand what it was. So you're going to hook up 21 uh, mobile homes to an IA system? Correct. Correct. Right. We're going to take 21 homes that are in the front currently on cesspools um, and we're going to hook them up to an IA system. If I remember correctly, Oh, which is scary. If I remember, we were going to do it in stages as people's leases expired, then offering them to move their mobile homes to this new lot. Is that the plan? Was, am I uh, that Kind question? of, not, not exactly. Okay. Please, if you can refresh. Yeah, so, um, so tenants, in New York State, in a mobile home park, are on year-to-year -year leases. Um, but um, we have neither the authority nor the desire to force anybody to do anything. Mm -hmm. And so um, the the plan here is to, um, as people, first of all, the homes that are in Section One are generally pretty small. Um, they're generally under 600 square feet um, and they're old. They date mostly to the 1960s and the early 1970s because that was the oldest, that was the initially developed portion of the community long before we owned it. Um, but even so, because we're in the town of Southampton and there's a, a, obviously a deficit of affordable housing, those units tend to sell for a what we would consider to be a lot of money for a mobile home of that vintage and that size. And when I say a lot of money, I mean 50, 60, $70,000. So um, the cost of the construction in the rear, um, even though a portion of it is covered by a grant, the cost is pretty significant. And um, so we can't both cover the cost of the construction and the cost of buying out people's homes in the front um, because that just makes the whole project economically not feasible. So what, what happens periodically uh, over a long period of time is homes are abandoned or they're what I would call donated to us uh, typically when the owner 
um, passes away and the children or the estate no, does not want the house and um, sees no value in it. So occasionally we pick up a house for free or we can get one at relatively low cost. And um, as that happens, um, we will uh, take title to the house in the front. We will abandon the house. I mean, literally uh, break it up and either tow it away or break it up and throw it in a dumpster. And then we will replace it in back with a new house. Sorry, can I interrupt them? Sure. Sorry. sorry, this is, um, these are great questions. I'm sorry to interrupt the board, but this is just to set the pre-submission. They have oh, okay. all the information. Because <laughs> you've got a two-step process here. There's gonna be a yeah, lot of okay. questions. And well, that's, so that's, you just have a big agenda that's, that's, too. And that's the big picture. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, these are the plans you submitted to me, right, Kim? So we've got them. We just need them electronically. Is that right? Yeah, I thought I had um, sent them electronically. Uh, that's fine. This, this afternoon, but I, I'll do it again. Yeah, that's fine. So these are the plans we have. We can, I think we have the basic information to do the site, uh, the, set the uh, pre-submission for the second meeting of uh, January. And of course, okay. you know, um, any questions the board has during the process, we'll, we'll get them to you and we can- Okay, great. That. Okay, I'm sorry. No we problem. <laughs> So can I have a motion to motion. Set a pre-submission conference by Phil for January 28th and second, second by Gloria and all in favor. You can close the screen, the sharing. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Thank you. Thank Very you. hard when someone comes right in the middle of taking a vote. Where am I? Jackie, just a reminder, we do have the ZBA coming in right behind us. At, so they, they're asking us to wrap at 545. Okay. So, so it was I a good have a, I have a motion on the table. It was moved by who? Phil. Phil and I seconded it. Seconded by Gloria. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, abstention. Six in favor, one absent. Thank you. Happy holidays. Your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chicken Briar Hill, Jackie Fenland. Yes. Yes, hi, um, Chicken Briar Hill. They just asked for a standard one year extension of the pre-application report, which would take them until December of 2021. Okay, motion, motion by Phil, second by Gloria, and all in favor? Aye. Opposed, of sanction, six in favor, one absent. Anthony, you have Peconic Paddler with a 90 day extension. Yep, um, this is just their first extension to get the final maps to us. Uh, so the extension would be from November 25th, 2020 until February 23rd, 2021. Motion. Motion. Motion by Phil, second by Glorian, all in favor? Aye. Opposed, abstention, six in favor, one absent. Eight is the Long Island Automobile and that's a 90 day extension, Claire. Yes, this is their first extension. They need it uh, because they're working out the town engineer issues. Um, but they should be momentarily ready to uh, submit for a signature. Okay. Motion. Motion by Phil, second by Robin, all in favor? Aye. Opposed abstention, six in favor, one absent. And then finally, a 90 day extension on the canal apartments. The same okay. thing. They're uh, just wet wrapping up their, their site plans and okay. momentarily. Okay. Motion. Motion by Glorian, second by Robin, all in favor? Aye. Opposed abstention, six in favor, one absent. So we finished the extensions and now we're on to Matthew. We are Puppy, Mongo or Long Island Cares. Yep, we have some signage proposed. I'll just show you uh, what the applicant's proposing. Um, it's been to the ARB already. Um, so one second, uh, let's see, aerial of the property. Um, this is a site plan. So they're proposing a wall sign here. If you can see my cursor. Yes. And an existing uh, freestanding sign here, and they're going to be adding a placard to that. Um, this is the proposal for the wall sign, 144 inch by 28 inch as shown. Uh, it's off to one side just because the building is all the way in the back, and they want to catch people's eye as they come in as they're driving down. Um, this is the original proposal for their placard on the freestanding sign. Uh, the ARB, you know, just thought it was a little busy, so they recommend recommended changes. Uh, which the applicant provided here, just a little bit more simple, uh, tells you what it is, identifies where it is, 
Um, Good, and you have a PMS on the brown? PMS on the brown and the green. Um, just a couple of revisions they need just to revise the site plan to identify <coughs> what the are gonna be and show the PMS numbering for the placard sign. Okay, so motion to accept this by Dennis, second by Phil, all in favor. Aye. Opposed abstention, six in favor, one absent. Claire, you've got the Homeland Towers water mill report. Yeah. Uh, you know, all the sun is coming in. Done. Really good thing. <laughs> it is. Um, if you go to Robert Gardio, so in uh, Charles, for that application. Um, I had sent you the separate resolution to be considered um, on this application. I'm just going to go over. Um, we got some public comments in between um, the last meeting and now. So I'm going to share the screen with that. And so the additional co public comments were erosion control and truck access, lighting, they recommended a lower Kelvin 2700, which was a good comments because I included that in the comments um, conditions. Six foot trees insufficient, near need irrigation, recommend a higher fence of nine feet, nine feet. Tower should be hurricane proof, which it is. It's pursuant to the town uh, to building code. And then concern with impact of EMF on plants and bees. The town and uh, fire marshal actually proposed um, sent the referral. Uh, describe the application. The property currently has a flag lawn on it for vehicle storage not approved for the site. It should be clarified that this issue has been addressed or corrected and is compliance with the approved uses on the property, which is good, good points. And then the proposed installation is for, um, for the far western rear portion of the property is the direct proximity to the Long Island Railroad branch line. It should be clarified that the distance from the railroad line is uh, approved by the MTA. And the applicant has provided some information about that that I think he's going to address with you. Um, access to the proposed site uh, is provided and maintained at all times. So we had talked about the last time about the language. Um, you wanted the comments for the building inspector added, which I added his um, email verbatim. Um, and then the additional uses on the property. I put some additional language in the conditions, but we might want to tighten them up. So as you have readily pointed out, the um, original approval actually proposed no outdoor storage for any of the uses on the property, even the irrigation use, which was the other use. But they are since then using the property for uh, outdoor storage. So it needs to be, they, they pro you could propose it and approve it, um, with the existing construction company, irrigation company. However, they have to provide some parking associated with that. Um, so they'd have to either legalize those uses at, or, and, or um, remove them from the site. Just for you to know, I went yesterday and there's only four cars left in the back. They so moved them out. They've been moving them out, which is going in the right direction. So that's a good, good sign. There was like four left in the back. Um, the newer cars that we were talking about. So, um, so now we're focused on the approved site plan for the front business, the irrigation business. Right, the middle business, I would call it, yes, because they have the building in the middle of the property. Yes. So Ethan Allen's the one in front. Ethan Allen. Ellen, yes, exactly. So, so so did we indicate parking on that? And uh, well, that would be, I wouldn't even know with how much they're using for outdoor storage right now. So they'd need to come in with a plan, you yeah. know, that you can look to it. Um, but that is the use. So the language I used, um, maybe I'll just go to the resolution, but maybe in the meantime, the applicant would like to, I'm going to stop sharing and the applicant might want to speak about the MTA issue. Uh, Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Claire. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the board. I hope okay. uh, you all did okay in the storm. Um, I'm glad to hear that the cars are on the way out. Um, and we do understand that there was uh, some conditional language added to the draft resolution that, that I think we're comfortable with. Uh, as far as the MTA, there, there's just simply no requirement for MTA approval. Uh, we double and triple checked the legislation and what we submitted was a letter uh, confirming that. And in fact, we submitted a number of photographs even from the town of Southampton showing that even the MTA has telecommunications towers on their uh, property adjacent to uh, the tracks uh, on Long Island uh, with Long Island Railroad, the Hudson Valley uh, on Metro North and, and throughout the region. So 
Um, we would have no objection to a condition that said, if necessary, obtain MTA approval, but uh, we're, we're confident that there is no MTA approval legally required. And we did, if you recall, move the tower even further, and we submitted the structural analysis letter with the uh, fall zone to keep the tower on the property. So if you want, I can share the screen with the conditions. Are you prepared? So the conditions, um, the no, when one A would be note the color of the pole. Two is the um, note the mounting height of the lighting fixtures to be 10 foot or less. Uh, three would be, or C would be the LED to 3000 or less, which is per the code. And then our standard general conditions, which is the screening of mechanicals, the uh, no installation of dusted on lighting fixtures, no additional lighting without planning board approval, lighting should be shielded, antennas shall be in the interior of the wireless facility, any change will require additional review and approval by the planning board, all future, proposed and future equipment shall be installed inside the fenced area, the town engineer requirement for a meeting. And so this is the language we might want to tighten up. I said the existing new car storage and storage associated with the existing uses on the property shall be removed from the property or an application should be submitted to legalize the same prior to the signature of the plans. But we don't want that. What, what, what are we legalizing here? Well, you could we can make this two issues if you want. I could do two, one, which is the existing new car storage, right? Shall be removed from the property prior to signature and just like, Yes, it's clean. Yeah, just that one clean. The yeah. other one we could, because if it if they're going to do a small storage area, uh, you know that they can provide the parking. I think you would find that reasonable, right? Because the HB notice on the property. So yeah. I'll leave it as a second issue. The storage associated with existing uses on the property would have to come back in for your approval. How's that? One yeah. of the two and issues. Should, shouldn't you define that ex that existing tenant? Yeah, it's an irrigation business, so we could easily do that. I, just, I think it just it's cl it's clear it's for me. Okay, right. We don't want Ethan Allen storing their furniture out there, right? So, so. all the cars that are being moved out, um, is that part of the land that's being leased by the cell tower? Robert, I think it is, right? I, I think the at least the last time I was out there, which was maybe a month or two ago, they had it on the whole back end of the property, including our lease area. Um, Claire was out there more recently, so I'm not I'm not sure where you know where it's left at this point. I would describe it as um, being uh, there's probably a little bit more right than your just lease area because it's kind, yours is kind of like a tight triangle area all the way in the back, correct? Yeah, so it may be not a perfect overlay, but it's approximate. So what happens to that land? Is that used and leased by the irrigation people? Or is it just a, no we don't want to create a no man's land that'll fill up again with storage. Well, we have our access through that area to get to our compound. So that's part of, and we showed that on our plans. So we need that access and we'll certainly enforce that access right as part of our lease. So some definition of meets and bounds, Claire, on that other back parcel. You want me to go back to the plan? I'm sorry. I want to start to stop sharing and it's easier if I do it that way. I can go back to the plan if the board wants to see it. I remember the tower is just one small piece of that back area. Yeah, but we have that, we have that whole fence compound and then we have the landscaping around it. We have the access coming through. So we take up a good portion of that. I do understand what you're saying. I just don't, what I want to do is just clarify that we don't wind up with a, an, a piece of land that who's responsible for that? Is that the irrigation company? Is that, have they leased that parcel or what is that, what parcel connected to? I think, I think Claire could share the plan. That we yeah, probably. let me show, I'm going back to, uh, so. Hey. And it's fairly active. So when you go in the back there, there's the year again. Well, I can't show you my, my cursor, but yeah, it's fairly active with the circulation coming through there and the irrigation system. I mean, they're, they're fairly, every time I've been out there, they've been fairly active turning around and moving through that area. You know, I'm surprised the cars lasted as long as they did given, given the access back there. 
So you can see it's it's not quite, uh, there's a lot more area with the cars that were happening. And I'm sorry, the property, you know, plans get cut off. But this was the entire area. If you can see my cursor, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. My cursor. This was the entire area, but their lease area is more like this. So yeah, there's this whole in between mm -hmm. that's, um, that they had been using that needs to be controlled. Yeah. yeah. So. So we'll Wouldn't that have been controlled with the prior site plan from the- um... Absolutely. If you want to look at the, I do have the entire site plan um, and I think that does show up. I think that's right. So you can see that. Um, so this whole area, you can see that there was not supposed to be any outdoor storage here or, or here. Right. There was no outdoor storage. So that it's very clear. We can give them a violation tomorrow for this, you know, and uh, if they don't respond or for some reason, we can, we can get them to start acting on this. Okay. okay. But I'll put that language with the two separate issues. How's that sound? So there's no, no man zone. We know exactly who was responsible right. for which sections now. Right. Exactly. In the old site plan. Okay. Right. Exactly. Okay. Um, so then otherwise it's the standard affidavit, success of plans, and there will be a maintenance bond for the air providers on the property. Okay. Okay. So can we have a motion to accept the report? Motion. Motion. To by adopt the resolution. Yep. Second. Second. Second by Glorian. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstention? Six in favor, one absent. Good. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank I you. appreciate your professionalism and, and your staff and Claire has been great. So thank you very much thank for all the courtesy. You. Thank you. Thank you. Happy holidays. <laughs> Happy holidays. Okay, Grabeski, want to go to the Grabeski airport traffic discussion? Yeah, so we got um, on Monday, uh, McLean came in and I'm actually going to ask um, Charles in the meantime while I'm speaking to let uh, Ray Tobias in, is the consultant for McLean. Um, Kristen McCabe, um, and also uh, Guy Germano, and I think they do have other additional people to come in too. So okay. well, um, we just got that report. I just got it today. I've not read it. So. Right. So today, so on Monday was Ray Tobias's reports. Um, that I so, yes, yeah, so that's good. And this uh, last night they sent me their response, and then Ray, very good. He's right on it has another response to it. So I'm going to, um, I'm first, I'm going to let Ray speak about it because his was the initial. Um, He's our consultant. Well, yeah, the consultant, his was the initial. So some, I mean, I think um, when I briefly addressed and looked at Ray's comments, a couple things have been addressed, but the substance of his initial report um, is stand is stands. He, we need more information at the end of the day, you know, related to traffic. But I'm going to let um, Ray speak to that um, when he comes in, and uh, obviously, we're just gonna. Um... You here? There's somebody here, but there's no. Oh yeah, there he is. And he's muted. You just unmute yourself, Ray. Yeah. There you go. Good. Great. Okay. All right. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for uh, having me, uh, Madam Chairperson and uh, board members. Um, my, first, I'd like to say it's been a while since I've appeared before this board and I recognize some of the members, but um, I just thought I'd give like a one minute uh, summary of my qualifications for those of, you, those of you who don't know me. I'm a registered professional engineer. I'm a certified professional traffic operations engineer and a professional transportation planner. Um, I'm a, uh, we'll be talking a little bit about ITE, that's the Institute of Transportation Engineers. Um, I'm a past president of the ITE's New York, New Jersey Metropolitan Section and a lifetime member of ITE. Uh, I'm also, uh, my other job is uh, chairman of a village planning board, <laughs> Village of Port Jefferson, where I've been uh, chairman for, I think about eight years now. Um, I've also been doing traffic study reviews for <clears throat> 30 years, on Long, all on Long Island, uh, for various municipalities. Um, just like to summarize, um, and, and Claire mentioned already what's been going on. Um, on the 14th, which was just Monday, I sent comments to Claire. Um, the applicant responded, or the applicant's uh, 
engineer has responded on the 16th, which was yesterday. I saw those comments this morning and I have given draft responses to Claire, sent them to Claire, so you'll be seeing them. And the way I set them up is you'll see the initial comment, the applicant's response for each item, and then our comments on their responses. So it's kind of an ongoing record of what's going on and everything's color coded. So it's a little bit easy to see. Um, I'm just gonna go through some of the highlights of the, um, the draft responses. And again, these are drafts. So um, I haven't gotten input from Claire, uh, some brief discussion, but not, not any input. So they'll need to be re revised and, and finalized wanted to focus on a few uh, key issues in this project. And one of them is trip generation. So that's the number of traffic trips that are going to be going to and from the site. And as you know, this site is part of the uh, airport plan development district, the PDD. Um, so the approach that was taken in the traffic evaluation that was submitted by Atlantic traffic was to uh, refer back to the prior uh, traffic impact study, which was done in 2011. So that study is about, um, it's almost 10 years old at this point. Um, so they were looking at the allowable trips to the entire PDD as part of the um, approval of the uh, environmental assessment back around the same time. Um, so there was a number of trips and there were identified land uses that were permitted in the, in the park. Since we're focusing on traffic, we're more interested in trips, number of trips for each and land use and collectively for all the land uses. So we'll focus on that as opposed to uh, staying away from the square footages of each of the uses that was identified in the original um, EAF. So the first issue is trip generation. Uh, we had commented that the, ap the evaluation focused on a comparison of those trips that were uh, estimated or approved in the uh, environmental assessment back uh, about 10 years ago. Ray, do you think, I'm sorry, the board, do you want me to put up his form? You're gonna go through your report, right? Do you want me to put that up? Sure. Up for the board to look at? Okay, I think I have it, so. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Here we go. You may want to have the uh, site plan available too, which I think I think there's a uh, on, and we don't on want, the last page of their response was a claims report, plan, but uh, it's not included in these comments. But you may want an or an aerial photo or something. Anyway, yeah, I'm more tactically. I'm going to try. <laughs> okay, uh, but I'll put your report up first, and then okay, we can take fine. any specific questions. Then we'll we'll just take a peek. But this is McLean's. Just so you, the board knows, this is McLean's comments, right? The at one, and this we is haven't the reviewed. Response. We have not reviewed this document, Claire. Right. So that's why I put it up. Right. But why can't we just review McLean's report? Because that's this is McLean's it. report. This is McLean's report. That number one is McLean. Right, so, when, or, so we're not going to read. My yeah, question uh, is, Atlantic has responded to McLean. Is that correct in this document? Correct. So we have not seen that. So we've looked at Mc, that McLean's report. And that's what we should be looking at right now. We can. If you want, we'll just focus on the initial comments, which are the for each numbered item there, the, 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 uh, the uh, text that's not in bold face. We can go through that. Claire, you can leave that up, Claire, if you want. I don't know. Um, I can put, I can actually put your report up. Oh, okay. Even better. Yes. It's much better and less yes. confusing. And, um, but if you want the site plan, it's gonna take me a minute. <laughs> uh, Claire, I'm totally yeah. confused. This gentleman, it, is working for who? Us. You. He's our traffic consultant. Thank you. We hired him to review. He didn't say that. The initial traffic study that Reckler submitted. This is Ray Tobias. He provided this report on Thank Monday. Thank you. Okay. okay. So if we'll take the comments one by one. Uh, first comment. 
and, and I want to go through these quickly because I know you don't have a lot of time and we could spend a lot of time on it. Uh, first comment just refers to county input and county comments. Uh, I know the applicants already contacted Suffolk County and that county has made some comments. So uh, that's good. That's a county road. They have jurisdiction over County Road 31, which is the providing access to the uh, entire uh, PDD. Uh, the next item or number two on the list uh, talks about the, the um, and I, I just gotten into this a little bit where, um, when we switched over, uh, the comparison is made to the 2011 traffic impact study and the number of trips that were identified in that study and then ultimately approved for the entire PDD. So the, the assessment or the traffic evaluation that was submitted by Atlantic focuses on the number of trips that were approved and then the estimated number of trips that will be um, drawn from this application and from the adjacent site at 230 Rogers Way, which are going to complete the development of the PDD. So the PDD is in place with the exception of these two parcels. I'm sorry, uh, Claire, can you zoom in a little of my tired eyes or? Yeah, I, 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 and I tried 100% and then it went off the screen completely. I am going to give it a try. Oh, is that okay? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Oh. No, I, I have to sit back. <laughs> so you're on number three. Yes, we're on number three. Um, so their initial approach was to do a comparison for the um, for this facility at 245 Rogers, which it, it's no secret, it's an Amazon last mile warehouse. I mean, it's public information. Um, so we know what, what the actual specific use is going to be. They related that to an ITE uh, land use code, which gives you the trip generation. And if you read that land use code in the ITE trip generation manual, which is a huge document, has all these land uses and the number of trips expected from each of them, it's most, most uh, akin to a high cube parcel warehouse. However, um, the, we looked into it a little bit more. We contacted ITE in Washington and actually talked to someone who worked on the data that went into that code 156, the high cube parcel warehouse. And it turns out that time-wise, that particular land use code did not include data from any Amazon uh, last mile facilities because it was done from data prior to Amazon developing these facilities, which was way back in 2013, by the way. You can move to the next page. So that being said, that that, that, that land use code, code is not really appropriate, we'd like to see data from a similar facility on Long Island. Uh, we do know, and we have conducted reviews for other municipalities for other Amazon facilities. In fact, four of them, this is the fourth, including the Syosset site at uh, Cerro Wire, uh, which, was, it, which is adjacent to the uh, LIE and Syosset. That's a much larger facility, but we have looked at three smaller ones, including one in uh, Shirley that's actually open now. And it is quoted in the, um, in the do documents from Atlantic Traffic as a similar facility. Um, so we're saying you can't really use that ITE data. It's not, even though it's theoretically a warehouse, this is kind of fits the general category of a warehouse, but it's site specific. And it, these facilities are very, um, very specific in terms of the traffic generation, how they operate, you know, tractor trailers coming in per day, and then vans picking up packages to go out and deliver them during the day. Um, so we said, let's, let's look at, let's give us some data from a familiar, uh, similar facility on Long Island or as best as possible on other Amazon facilities. We know there's a lot of data out there because there's hundreds of these now in, in the United States. Number, comment number five um, talks about the hourly arrival and departure breakdown at the facility. Now, they have submitted information, an hour by hour breakdown 
of traffic coming to and from the site. And to just summarize it, it talks about tractor trailers coming every day and they would come pretty much overnight before 8 a.m. So they're, they're coming in to the site with packages before the peak hour of the highway traffic, which is good, so it's off peak. Um, and then they unload the packages. Vans come in late morning and after the morning peak hour to pick up the uh, packages. And when I say vans, drivers are coming in with their own personal vehicles, parking them at the site, and then picking up a van, which is actually parked at the site overnight. Uh, they proceed to a queue or a, a line of traffic where the vans are loaded one by one uh, from the warehouse with their package runs. And then they leave and then they come back after the evening peak hour, theoretically uh, seven o'clock in the evening and later. So that's good again, that's away from the highway peak where you have the most highway traffic. So it's, it's theoretically off peak traffic impacts. Uh, Ray, could I interrupt you for just a second? Um, the tractor trailers come in during off peak, but when do they leave presumably empty? Uh, that's a good question. I know that I know we got the arrival time. We did not get the how the time it takes to unload them. I would think with the number of employees at the site, the unloading goes pretty quickly. Uh, but I'm sure they could provide that information. Good question. We also uh, were asking about um, traffic deviation. Um, if let's say if that uh, morning peak hour where the, where the vans come in, which could start as early as 10 or 11 in the morning, uh, if that slips a little bit earlier and the vans come in earlier, then there's an impact on theoretically on the highway peak hour where, where you could see some traffic impact during commuter hours, particularly for the rest of the facility, which is operating on more, more normal hours, hours. So we asked for really asking for adherence to the schedule that they provided. Uh, and that we thought should be a condition of approval of the project that their peak hour or their peak schedule basically every day of the tractor trailer deliveries and then the van arrivals and, and uh, or I'm sorry, the driver arrivals for the vans and then their uh, departures in the evening are outside the peak hour. Since they determined that's the case, that should be a condition of the approval. We don't want those peak hours, the peak hour for this facility coinciding with the highway peak hour. Ray, I have a quick question. Sure. Vans that deliver locally, mm -hmm. are they owned by individuals? So people come in on a car, in a car, they park their car and they take a van. Do their uh, work come back? The vans are Amazon van vans. They're parked at the site overnight. However, they did say that there would be 40 estimated, or actually that would be the number, 40 uh, private drivers who would bring their own vans to the facility to get loaded. So they're not, theoretically, they're not parking there. They're, they're coming in, getting online, getting packages and leaving. Um, we know from another site and item number uh, six refers to it. There is another Amazon, Amazon site on Long Island where initially in the traffic uh, impact study for the project, uh, it wasn't envisioned that offsite vans, we call them, would, would come in. Uh, however, uh, the concern or the statement was made that, well, we opened the facility and we needed, we needed these uh, additional vans to deliver packages, so we brought them in. But they're not parked there, but they do come in and out. So they are a trip to the site and they are traffic generated by the site. So being at the estimated 40 offsite vans, we thought that should be a condition of the project's approval because all the traffic impacts are based on these numbers and we wanna know that there's not gonna be a change once the facility is approved and oh well, you know, uh, we need more uh, activity in the peak hour, we got more packages, so we wanna you know, bring in more vans or have more drivers come in to use the vans. So the advantage, the advantage of the offsite vans is that they, as you mentioned before, they don't have to make that return trip in the evening. They, the drivers take them home. That's correct. Uh, but we have a substantial number of vans parked at the site. And, um, you know, the, the normal vans where the drivers come in and the actual Amazon vans, the Amazon, Amazon labeled vans, 
Um, so there's a, there's a very substantial number of, of uh, vans every day um, and van drivers that come in. So this is not a high percentage, but we're concerned that that could, could expand during peak periods or, you know, we need more drivers. So we brought them in, you know, and that you need to have some control over that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've seen at least one Amazon van every day for the past couple of months just in my local tra traveling around Southampton. Yeah. It's, there are lots of them. And yeah, and there's other delivery services too, but that's, that's something else. Right. Uh, item seven talks about uh, utilizing Sunrise Highway to travel to County Road 31 to gain access to the site. Um, and the applicant apparently in their response indicated they're already aware of this. Sunrise Highway is designated by, designated by DOT as an access highway, which allows them, which allows tractor trailers over 65 feet long and, and vehicles with 53 foot trailers to utilize the roadway, but they can't travel off of it uh, mm -hmm. unless you have another access highway. So County Road 31 needs to be designated as an access highway uh, from the interchange with Sunrise Highway south to the site. And which is a little bit more than a mile. So the applicants are apparently already working on it, they told us. Uh, number eight. Improve, do, excuse me, do they have to improve the road to make it uh, an access road? Uh, theoretically not, but if the state does have an option of saying, uh, when they issued the permit, uh, actually going out and looking at the road and saying, Wow, there's a lot of potholes on this road. If you run heavy trucks, you're really going to beat it, beat it up. We want you to uh, repave it. I mean, that's that's BOT's option. They have control over that. Okay. The uh, number eight, the primary site access to the facilities on County Road 31 at the at an unsignalized driveway at the north end of the site and at the existing uh, signalized, so it already has a traffic signal, Stewart Avenue Collins Way intersection. Uh, we wanted, we want them to go out since the data in the 2011 traffic study is so old. So you figure a traffic study in 2011 probably had, probably had traffic counts in 2010. So that's 10 years ago, right there. We wanted to have some confirmation because this is part of a big P PDD, which was expected to generate, uh, 500 trips in the, um, in the peak hour. So it's a, it's a good size overall development. Normally when you do a large development like this, uh, in particular, one I can remember is the um, development at the Expressway and William Floyd Parkway, the Northwest corner, which is a huge mixed use development. Uh, ABR Realty and Breslin were involved in that. That, when it was approved by the town of Brookhaven said, okay, when you get halfway through, because you're gonna develop this in stages, we want a new traffic study at key intersections. We want observations made to make sure that what you predicted is actually happening. So we just asked for traffic counts at, uh, in the morning and evening peak, peak hours at these two intersections to confirm that what's predicted, what's going in and out of the, of the um, of the airport, and I know you can't necessarily distinguish between airport traffic and um, PDD traffic, but we want to get a handle, since the data is so old, on what's going on and what the impact would be, if any, in the peak hours from this project. So we're asking for some traffic counts, which is something is, is doesn't take very long to do. You just schedule it, you have people go out and you actually count the cars. When I say traffic counts, you count the turning movements at the intersection. So you're counting left turns, right turns, through movements, and traffic engineers always work in peak hours. So we're always looking for that peak one hour volume. That's where all the capacity analysis is, what we, we call it is performed for that peak hour. That's the critical time period. Uh, moving on to number nine, we did ask, uh, during construction, a lot of times at a lot of large sites, there's extensive uh, truck uh, truck movements, uh, which could occur at times when it's undesirable for, for noise, uh, it, particularly if you're working after hours. We asked for a general discussion during the construction period, how many trucks per day, when would they 
uh, visit the site, how many about how many workers at the site, uh, just to get an idea of the trucks and cars during construction to make sure that there's nothing occurring during construction that might be a problem that <laughs> to have some type of uh, mitigation or control during construction. So that that's more of a discussion. It's not really a uh, an, a large analysis or, or anything that should take an ex extensive period of time. Um, do we have a do I have a double number nine there? Is that what? Because it looks like that short number nine. I'm sorry. Can we go back to number eight? I just referred to number nine uh, construction. That's eight. Oh, no, I, I asked for staff account. Yeah. I was finished with that. Okay. Yeah. So we covered nine. Number ten. Because the data is so old, the, the 2011 study, it's always a good idea to look for traffic accident data for, the, for um, occurring at, at places in front of a site. Are there any problems on the county road right now, which is the, is the road in front of the site? For example, uh, at the intersection of um, Collins Way um, and uh, County Road 31 is, is a traffic signal. If you're traveling south and you wanna make a left turn to go into the airport, there's no left turn arrow. We have half of the PTD developed and we have airport traffic. Let's look and see, do we need, not necessarily because traffic's backing up, but do we have problems there because there's a lot of left turns and maybe there's some trucks and there's some left turn accidents that we don't know about. So we're asking the applicant to do a traffic accident analysis and that's really a summary, a table uh, by uh, uh, describing the severity of the accident, where there are a lot of injury accidents, which are a red flag, the type of accident. Is there a left turn? Are there left turn accidents? Are there rear end accidents? Uh, day or night condition? Uh, is nighttime a problem? It shouldn't be here because the volumes are less. And the pavement condition. Is the pavement uh, in bad shape so that when, it, when there's snow or ice on it, there's skidding and, and it needs to be resurfaced. Uh, if there are any trends, we said, and a lot of times when type, a study like this is done, you don't really come up with a lot of different types where you can identify an accident trends. <clears throat> say there are no trends, so we're, we're good right there. But typically these studies involve collecting accident information for the latest available three year period. So if, you, if um, DOT was contacted now or Suffolk County, uh, they can <coughs> accident data probably, you know, it might be the beginning of 2020, back three years uh, to, to the uh, midpoint of 2017. I'm just using an example. But this is certainly better information than looking at, uh, than referring to the 2011 traffic study, which might have had accident data from to the late 2000s, so uh, 2007 through 2010, possibly. So that's that's dated data, it needs to be updated. And, and we need to see if there's any safety concerns out there that, that could be uh, made worse by this project. Uh, item 11, uh, we, we know, uh, we actually uh, saw, I think with the IDA fund approval, that uh, there would be no air freight deliveries because uh, that's a prohibition that uh, cargo freight can't be, uh, can't be uh, utilized at this facility. So that probably should be re reiterated in the approval of the project as well. Um, okay. Okay, then I, I, we had made several comments on the site plan. Uh, it was a little difficult to figure out how many spaces um, total were provided and, and provided for whom. So there were various uh, locations, uh, three or four different lots. Um, and there were additional, additionally, there were five spaces for storing tractor trailers, uh, probably really for queuing them. So if one or two were at loading docks and there, two more were coming in, they'd wait until the other ones cleared the loading docks and then they'd be brought over. Uh, we did receive a, a response on this one that was very, uh, that really confirmed what we had thought uh, and really addressed our, our question there. 
Uh, the second comment uh, talks about when the peak parking uh, hour would be, and that would be actually uh, between 6 a.m. and 12.30 because there would be 94 employees in the warehouse uh, and also a peak of 153 van drivers on the site uh, on a typical day. So that would be the, there would be 247 parked vehicles. Uh, there was some questions there about are the spaces enough? Um, and I will say that the, the response came in and that looks uh, very favorable that there are enough spaces. I think we, I need to take a little bit more further look at it, but uh, I think that was a, you know, we probably have a, a, enough parking on the site. Um, there was one question, however, on, on the parking is that when the 40 uh, non-employee van, van drivers came in, do they get right on line to get their packages or do they have to park first, walk to the office, check in and say, okay, I'm here. Uh, so, so do they need parking spaces or do some of them need parking spaces? So that needs to be, that needs to be clarified. Uh, number three, on the site plan, which is below. Okay, I made a, a comment uh, noting that the West Hampton Railroad Station is not far away. And it would seem that to give the employees who are working at the site the option of getting there by train, even though a train is not, particularly now, it's not a uh, very intense schedule, and particularly in, in this area. Uh, is that a possibility? And we did know notice from looking at uh, an aerial and also Google on the uh, at the station that there is a shortcut uh, being used from County Road 31 to go directly to the station uh, along alongside the railroad tracks. Now I know some railroad vehicles use that, but um, that gives you access to the parking lot. So you know possibly if this is viable where Amazon could institute a shuttle service to coincide with some train arrivals for people who don't own cars and want to work at the facility, uh, should they do that to reduce the number of track, the cars generated by the project and also allow people who don't own a car to work there. So uh, we did get a response on that one also. Number four, Uh, just looking at the site plan, uh, they have an exit from the van loading area toward the existing roundabout, and the roundabout is at Collins Way and Ro or Rogers Way intersection. Um, just thought that that exit from that roadway, uh, uh, exit from that area, from the van loading area where the vans then go out on the road and deliver packages is very close to the roundabout, so we made that comment, which they have responded to. Um, and then we made a comment, number five is a bit of a lengthy comment, but they do have a lot on the south side of Collins Way. And just uh, we were kind of firming up where um, those people, if they park their uh, cars there, where they would walk across uh, Collins Way, uh, that they should either do it at the traffic signal where there would, would be a crosswalk. Uh, or at the roundabout. So there needed to be a, a sidewalk connection between um, the lot and both of those crossings so that people wouldn't be walking, running across Collins Way at various points, they'd be walking at marked crosswalks. I think that's, that's the last comment. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um. I'm going to make a suggestion that, Ray, thank you. It was really a very thorough report that um, this board have an opportunity to read the Atlantic traffic design report that came in yesterday or today, I saw it. And so we can have a further discussion. Um, we do have time constraints. We have uh, other applicants uh, waiting. So, um, I don't know if anybody on the board disagrees with that, but I just think it's fair to give us the time to read uh, Atlantic Traffic Design's report so that we can 
then have a further discussion. I, I would suggest that if Claire can send us um, the, the, the second set of Ray's comments so we could see it all together. Because, yeah. um, and if you could send it in a format that we can read. It was really hard. I, I do my best. I couldn't read it on my, on my computer and I had to blow it up on my iPhone and keep doing this because I could only see about half a, half a line of type. Okay. Um, did, Ray, did your comments include those two? Well, not the tractor trailer, right? The departure time, we want to include that, right? And then we also, the vans need parking or will they get in the queue? So is that in your second set of comments or no? I believe the, the vans in the queue is in the second set, but not the tractor trailer departures. Okay, so we'll just have to note that. Um, but yes, I can give, give, uh, give them some. Maybe let the applicant speak at this point if the board is. Jeff, I, just briefly, I mean, this was our report to observe. Yes. Oh, Madam, yeah. 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 Madam Chair, just a, 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 yes. a couple of things. Um, first, um, we would ask that, you know, while we're, while you're reviewing our comments and the reports getting further review, if you could send our, our site plan out for review to the other agencies so that we could get their comments as well, I think that would help everybody um, to get a full, um, full review of the plan and we get it all back at once and not do it sort of piecemeal. So typically we do CRA prior to deeming an application completes um, and uh, scheduling the public hearing. If they would just like to do the referrals and not deem the application complete for purposes of hearing, I think that's something that's reasonable if the board is amenable. Uh, we just wouldn't schedule the public hearing yet because the plan could change, of course, based on this, the traffic comments. So. It's up to you. Yes, that's what we We could do that. I think I'm okay with that. Okay. Robin, you're muted. I'm muted, Robin. I had a lot of do barking dog. I had to mute myself. I, I think that's perfectly reasonable. Um, as long as nothing is being deemed, nothing is moving ahead. And we still have all the review and all the time. Right. Any new timings or anything. I have no objection to having the other agencies look at it so we can get a full report. Right. And obviously if something changes significantly, we'll refer, refer to, you know, engineering and or fire marshal, those applicable agencies. Okay. That's I find that reasonable. In the meantime, you'll have to take some time. Maybe the applicant can firm up some of these conditions or these questions for the to address raised concerns, you know, in the traffic. So that would be great. Well, we we have time to review them. That's what's important. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, thank Referrals. you all for, I'm glad you didn't have to get in a car and drive, so uh, thank you. Thank you guys. So there's so no I'm, here. I'm going to probably ask you for, uh, I might want a resolution just to do the referrals. What's um, kind of resolution? Just authorizing the staff to do referrals. On the I'll agency. move that. What, what agencies are you sending it to? Um, all, everything typical with a site plan application. So we okay. have we have requirements with that. As long as we're not cutting ourselves off from no. the review. You would not be deeming the application complete. We would just be doing the referrals. So how would you word that? Uh, the uh, planning board authorized the referrals pursuant to the code to proceed. Okay. Motion. Kathleen, is that pursuant to the code? Yeah, that's fine. Oh, You're not deeming it complete, so that's fine. Okay. okay. Motion by Phil, second by second. Dennis, all in favor. Aye. Opposed abstention, six in favor and one absent. And uh, you'll get us the additional materials. Yep. Thank you very much, Ray. Appreciate the report. Thanks, everyone. And thanks directly crew for- oh, Thank you, Madam Chair, yeah. members of the board. Thank you. Have a happy holiday. Happy holiday to you too. So moving along.
to Matthew, number 13, 12, Foster. For, for the hundredth and eleventh time. Yeah, for the last time. <laughs> um, it, it, it'll be the last time. Is Wayne here for that? Yeah, Charles, can you let Wayne in, please? And I'll, uh, I'll share the screen and give you guys a very brief update. Uh, and then we can move forward. So we're getting shutters, right, Matt? Yeah. <laughs> Not to my knowledge. <laughs> Full screen. Okay, so you see the aerial, everyone's familiar. Um, so it's gonna be, it's a little slight change since I sent you guys the report, uh, my attachments. Um, I was able to get a revised plan from the applicant. I don't know if everyone can see this, but they submitted this on the 15th. This uh, is just the aerial we have up. Oh, you, know, you, you can't see the plan? No. Nope. stop and start it again. Hi, Wayne. Hi, guys. Hope everyone's staying the warm. You see the plan now? Yes. yes. Okay. So they uh, submitted a revised plan on the 15th, uh, indicating some arborvitae along the northern side here, which will help break up the facade. Uh, those will be six feet on center, as well as two, uh, two trees. Uh, there's a Chinese elm here, and there'll be a street tree as well. Uh, this is in addition to uh, the arborvitaes that are going to screen the parking on this side. Um, you know, we, we're not going forward with the curb cut closure. I did amend the staff report to include your findings um, from the board. Uh, you know that the you know, mm -hmm. excluding the recommendation for the curb cut closure because uh, that'll preclude the use of the loading dock um, onto the next page. And then there's another finding in terms of the screening that's been put in place by the applicant. Um, and then uh, that there will be no five changes. Uh, the only outlying issue is the uh, dumpster enclosure. I understand that it's been there for a number of years. Uh, it exists here on the property. Unfortunately, that's in a front yard. It's not permitted by code. So a conditional approval will just be that it's moved to a conforming location in the rear or the side. Uh, the best option I see for that, if you guys can see my cursor up here in the corner, um, up there, and just that it'll conform to all requirements of the town code. Um, and then I don't know if Wayne has everything at anything to add, but I do have a resolution prepared and I can go through the conditions. So just let me say, since I was the one who did most of the uh, belly aching a couple of weeks ago that I spent some time at the site and there just isn't any way to gussy up this building with anything. But I was going to ask for additional trees on the north side. So I see that they're being offered. And that to me is a decent compromise. So they, thank they you. didn't tell you about they didn't tell you about the six additional loading bays. <laughs> <laughs> well when those loading bays are used, uh, we'll have a celebration. <laughs> but in any event, um, I'm fine with it, Matthew. So okay, I can uh, go through the conditions if everybody's comfortable. Sure. Okay, so changes to the plan. Just to add notation that you know there's an existing curb uh, cross access curb cut that's not 20 feet in length in uh, width, just to show that that's going to be made to the proper width. A certification stating capacity of each drainage structure that came out of the engineer's office. Uh, planting details for the trees and shrubs. Uh, that's something easy that there's uh, the uh, that Bob Smith can show on there. Just the details how they'll be planted. Uh, any lighting details for any proposed lighting uh, need to be included with. Um, lumens and temperatures and to relocate that dumpster to a conforming location. We have general conditions. I don't know if the planning board wanted to see signage on this. There's no signage proposed. I don't know if there'll be anything in the future. I can take that out if you don't think it's warranted. Yeah, uh, we'll deal with it when it when it happens. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll leave it in. Okay. Uh, HVAC screening, no dust at all light fixtures, no additional lighting without planning board approval, downward facing, all non-conforming lighting shall be removed and conforming lighting shall be installed. Um, attain all required permits for the Southampton Town Highway Department. Uh, no trucks will be permitted to park in the front uh, facing Butter Lane overnight. No outdoor storage. Uh, an engineering fee of $2,450. Pre-construction meeting with engineering. Uh, prior to signature, submission of a cross-access easement to the adjacent pro uh, property that's for the parking that straddles the property line. 
uh, notarized affidavit in con indicating compliance with the conditions of the site plan. Uh, that should say six sets of plans. I'll change that uh, for signature and then prior to CO, a maintenance bond for the uh, plantings. Only six plans, Matt? Six plans, Wayne. Wayne, any anything to add or? No, Matt and I have had discussions over the week and we had a discussion about the uh, dumpster area that the planning board expressly approved in 2004, although the code was changed in 2003 and it's been there for a while. Mr. Wisnowski is aware of that. And, and I think Matt's location is where they'll probably end up locating that and you'll probably see a plan uh, you know, showing that uh, in the near future. Otherwise, all the conditions are acceptable. We agreed to do the trees as suggested by the board last week. And I think we need to get this off everybody's table. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> motion, motion to approve. Motion. By Glorian, second by Robin. All in favor? Aye. Opposed, abstention, six in favor, one absence. Thank you. Great, thank you for your patience. Have a good holiday. Thanks, Wayne. So, uh, Matthew, stay there. You're, you have a reveg plan, number 14, Peter and Tara. Think. I lost my share screen. Hold on one second. You can like your decorations. Thank you. <laughs> this is nice, the swag. Let's see if I can share. It's back. You need anyone in? Um, Kevin Springer might be there. He was having some tough technical difficulties, um, but if not, I think we can handle this pretty quickly. Um, this is 537 Watermill Towd. Uh, this came in via the building department. Unfortunately, uh, the applicant proceeded to revegetate the property themselves absent your approval. Um, so this was subject to my inspection a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I went out and did an inspection of the existing clearing lines, what they planted, everything is you know natural to what we would recommend ever, anyway. So they you know must've had someone who had an idea of what was going on. So this'll be essentially just to memorialize that they did do a revegetation and it conforms. Uh, a little bit different in the uh, approval, this'll just say that you know there's no issues to a CO or CO, uh, CC as appropriate from the uh, building division. And are we putting that clause in the reveg plans? The it's, it's all it's done. It's a yes, but it's done already. So okay. Yeah, it's it's already been installed. Good. So motion to approve. Motion. By Florian. Second by Dennis. All in favor? Aye. Opposed. Abstention. Six in favor. One absent. We've done the two referrals. We've done route to, so we're moving on to Claire to J B Properties. That's the car dealership on twenty seven. Yep. So at the last meeting, you had assumed lead agency, and in this decision, you would um, uh, make it secret determination. And you had some questions, a couple of board members had some tra questions about traffic um, that the applicant no responded to, who has been responded to. Um, so the applicants in this case are Bailey Larkin, and if Charles, you could let in Mike Shiano. Claire, did you use a new forum for the secret? I noticed in looking at it that it was a different kind of form. Um, so there's two different forms that there was adopted by the um, DEC at the um, beginning um, of 2018. Um, so this is the long form. So sometimes you see the short form for unlisted actions, but in this case, this was the long form. Um, so in this case, I do have a draft. There's some questions that you wanted answered. Um, I'm going to have the applicant speak to it. He sent a report on Tuesday, I think, and I had forwarded to the board. I'm just going to have the applicant do it. And right now I have access to the town website. So very excited. So um, Mike, do you want to speak before or Bailey, you want to speak before? Or do you want me just to share your reports with the board? I think we had a question about the car wash. And the point about the car wash, that it would be a closed system. So that would be something that we'd want to put into the documents. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Bailey, do you want to say something, anything first? Or do you want me to just go into the traffic stuff? No, Mike, you can go right into the traffic stuff. Okay. Um, so at the end of the last meeting, um, uh, uh, 
Chair LaFaro had some uh, concerns about potential uh, traffic that would be generated by this um, uh, use, uh, but by the addition uh, to the uh, building. Um, so uh, when preparing the long form EIF part one, um, uh, there, there was one, there is a specific question in that form that uh, asks whether the uh, proposed action will uh, result in a substantial increase in traffic above present levels. Um, when I uh, answered that question, uh, I had reviewed uh, the Mercedes of Southampton traffic, traffic report to uh, um, find out whether, uh, uh, to confirm, um, whether there were uh, more recent traffic counts that were done uh, for that uh, use. Uh, instead of going to like the ITE reports, um, I, I thought that finding something that was um, about, you know, th th this uh, Lexus is 1.7 miles east of the Mercedes dealership. Uh, so it was a more local use um, and trying to figure out um, uh, a, another auto dealership and auto service um, use. Uh, so we were actually comparing kind of apples to apples in terms of traffic and trip generation. Um, so I was able to find out and, and, and retrieve information from that report. Um, Claire, can you just scroll down a little bit? Sure. Um, so the, uh, in determining the proposed trip generation, um, th there were four different uh, uh, peak periods um, that uh, were identified during uh, in that report, uh, and that report was prepared by a traffic engineer. Um, so, so it was all um, done by, by someone who knows a little bit more about what they're talking about in terms of the calculations and stuff. So, I, I was just using the work product that they had provided, um, and they had determined um, uh, these four peak periods: uh, morning. Uh, peak period, uh, the midday, uh, PM, and, and the Saturday peak. And uh, as a result of the actual traffic counts that they had um, uh, completed, they determined four different um, traffic generation uh, calculations based on a per 1,000 square foot of gross floor area calculation. So I then used this information and applied it to what <clears throat> we were proposing at the uh, Lexus dealership. Um, can you just scroll down to page two, Claire, please? So um, I provide, so I had done all of these calculations when I provide, when I prepared the EAF. Um, and that's why when I was preparing the EAF, I answered no to the, uh, to whether there was a, um, uh, an increase, a, sustain, a substantial increase in traffic. Um, and uh, because uh, as you will see here, the numbers that were, the, the increase that resulted in the uh, proposed addition um, were only a, between five and six additional trips uh, during each of the uh, peak periods. So um, during the uh, AM, uh, the, the morning commute traffic, um, there would be an increase of 6.16 additional trips during the midday, which is between um, uh, 11 and uh, 12 uh, p.m., um, uh, 11 a.m. and 12 p.m., the additional trips was 5.31 uh, p.m. Uh, in the evening, um, trips increased by 6.67, and then uh, on Saturdays, trips would increase by 5.82. Um, and in order to compare that, uh, when doing environmental impact analysis, we had to have existing actual, uh, traffic counts for this area. Uh, so I, uh, researched it and, uh, found, um, the Suffolk County DPW's information for County Road 39A, um, and the, the site that they actually, uh, used to, um, to count, uh, the, the point where the counts were taken was only about 350 feet west of this property. So it, we had really good and accurate information. While this was done in August, 2015, um, the numbers should still be uh, pretty accurate. Um, I doubt it. I doubt it. So, the, so, it, so if, if, if that is true, 
that means that the numbers that we are providing in this report would actually be less than what were uh, done in today. So the, so the existing traffic volumes would be greater, which would mean that the percent increase that you would see as a result of this project would actually be less. Well, well, so, if, um, so what, what, what I was able to conclude from this, uh, Claire, can you just scroll down, please? Was that the percent increases um, were less than 1% across the board because we were only adding between five and six when compared to the existing traffic counts of, 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 a, of a few thousand, uh, one to 2,000 um, in, in, uh, in each of these periods. Um, so if, if it is the case that the existing traffic counts of, two, of 2020 um, were, are higher, which we, we, we can all assume that they are, then these percentages would actually be less than that. Um, and uh, the, the, the good thing about the information that we had about Mercedes was that those numbers were only taken uh, two years ago, um, two, three years ago. So um, that they are, uh, uh, a little bit closer in, in time frame. Uh, the, so because the uh, anticipated increase in traffic levels was less than 1% across the board, uh, I had concluded and answered on the long form EIF that this would not result in a substantial increase in traffic because it's um, because we have to compare it to existing conditions. Um, and the, the addition is only an addition of, of uh, uh, I don't have, I'm sorry, I don't have the exact uh, number in front of me of, of what the addition is, but it's, you know, 5,000 plus square feet. Um, so, and part of that addition um, is also an addition that is just enclosing uh, existing space that is already being used as, uh, so part of it is a service bay that we're just enclosing. So even though that that's an increase in, in GFA, it's still being used as the same thing um, and the same uh, goes for part of the uh, existing sales area. We're just enclosing an existing outdoor display and making an indoor display. So uh, in actuality, the traffic counts, the additional traffic trips should be less than this um, because the uh, addition of the extra square footage of the garage is, um, is the actual increase in use of the site is going to be decreased as a result of this. So um, that's how I arrived at these numbers. And this is how uh, I was able to answer that information on the long term EIF. Um, if there's anything else that you have uh, concerns about, about whether uh, additional traffic could be generated, um, I am here to answer your question. Do you propose that this car wash is open to the public? Uh, no, the car wash will only be used um, for when after cars are sold, uh, they will be, you know, the, the cars that are uh, being stored on the site would be uh, washed. And, and I believe that they um, on, on, there is a possibility that they would be using them only for uh, uh, service use also. Uh, so, so people who are having their car serviced um, and, um, having their, when someone buys a car, they would then wash it for them. Uh, but it's not a car wash that, that people off the street can just come in and only use that. Um, so it, it's, it's not its own use by itself. Well, traditionally, when you hire end cars, when you bring your car in for service, they courtesy wash it for you. Correct. So that, that is, in my initial discussion, um, they had indicated to me that, that the, uh, the car wash would be used when the cars are sold. But that is why when I was just mentioning that, I, I realized that there is a good possibility that they would, as, as you mentioned, Glorian, that they would use it when someone comes in to service their car. But it wouldn't be its own trip generation uh, uh, use on the site. So this is a closed system Car wash, yes. you know, very difficult to get a car wash in the east end of Long Island because of the environment. So there is no impact on groundwater. There's an existing car wash on the site. Is I'm not, am I not mistaken, Mike? 
That's what I, I I'm, would I'm, I'm not sure about I don't know if there's an existing car wash building on the site. Um, I do know that uh, the health department requires that um, uh, during our review with the health department, they asked whether this would be a open system where it would just go to drywalls and then be uh, uh, drained into the groundwater or if, if it would be a completely closed system. And we are proposing a completely, compl uh, completely closed system that would have to be pumped out um, because uh, of the, um, the flow rate that would result from this would be over what we were able to have on the site. So th there is a completely separate process that, that, the, uh, that the site is going to have to go through with the, office, the sub county office of pollution control. Um, and, and there will be a permit process to make sure that they meet all of the, um, the, the county sanitary code requirements for this so that so that the concerns that you have about potential increases in uh, flow to the groundwater and, and potential pollution would, would be completely avoided. Um, well, so we, there are, there's, go ahead. I'm we, sorry. Have, we have those conditions, Claire, in the... Yes, we could definitely have the, I had made a note from the last time that the, the system would be closed and there would be conditions. So um, that would be part of the secret. If there's any change like the health department or anything like that, they'd have to come back and reopen the secret issue. Oh, based on what I'm hearing, then this is a new a new car wash. It does sound like it. I'm sorry, I, I was misunderstanding yes. that. Yep. Yeah, and that, so that's why we questioned the review of the, uh, of the list, you know, the long form list that impact on water, groundwater, et cetera, that, that that's why we had to go back to it. Right, but I'll put that language in there. That's, that's okay. not a problem. You know, I read your traffic report, Mike, and uh, just so that you know, uh, this facility is on Route 27. It's not on County Road 39. And it's a different stretch of road that's right before that turn that you go into County Road 39. So it's really not apples and apples. Uh, and so your use of Mercedes, I discussed it with Claire, didn't think was that there was a, any kind of parity between the two, but you did, you've done further analysis. So um, I understand where you went, but they're not the same. I understand. So um, the uses themselves, so the creation of car trips to the property um, because the uses are so similar. That was the part that I believe was similar. And that's why I didn't use the same existing counts from the Mercedes. I had to, use, I had to go find the, um, the existing traffic counts for uh, County Road 39A, uh, the, the, the road that this is on. Uh, I had to find that information uh, myself to compare the proposed numbers. So it wasn't like I just took everything straight from the Mercedes report. I made sure to find out what our actual existing conditions were, uh, granted as you, they were from August of 2015. Um, but that is the information that we had available from the Suffolk County DPW. Um, so, yes. And just because now I'm confused, I thought I knew which, what, which, which car dealership this was. This is the one that's opposite the, the diner. No, it is opposite the farm field, um, or opposite. Um, it's next to, uh, next to uh, Hampton Coffee. No, it's not next to Hampton Coffee. It's down further. It's closer to uh, North Main Streets. By it, the Hampton Jitney Building. I'm sorry. Bailey? By the Hampton Jitney Building. About two lots. Yes. Yep. I still. I'm sorry. I did. I did not hear what you said. The Hampton Jitney Building. Oh, okay. Thank you. They're, 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 they're all the same to me. And I very rarely, I almost never drive on County Road 39 because it's a death trap. So it's, I don't go there very often. That's why we need a traffic <laughs> here, right, Robin? <laughs> um, so I'm prepared to put all those comments in and, and related from the last meeting, they have agreed to do an IA system um, for the project, which I think goes a long way for the existing sanitary and any additional sanitary on the sites. Um, obviously, they have an existing cross access easement agreement, which they'll have to bind to and that's a, a, a good tool for the future too. Um, they're not that far away from um, North Main streets, so there are only a couple properties away from that so that would be that would be helpful in the future. Um, I can I'm prepared to put those documents together and I'll forward to 
you if the board is amenable to a negative declaration with those conditions. Can I have a, you want a resolution, right? Yeah, it will be a resolution. And again, I'll forward you all those documents with all those comments that we've been discussing in this meeting and the last meeting. Okay. Someone want to make a resolution? I don't, I, there seems to be a lot of adjustments to this. To this. Am I you want to wait then? I would like to see the documents. I, I'm, I'm not quite. I, I understand, Mike, what you're saying is that we have existing use. We're just continuing the existing use. You're <coughs> closing the existing use. You're counting the numbers based on, on that. I understand that. There seems to be a lot of conditions that are floating around. Is there a problem with getting a final document before we, we pass on it? Bailey, when's your decision uh, for the ZBA? Do you have a, a date yet? This is the second meeting? Second meeting in January. Okay, so we have a meeting on the 14th. So that, I think that works. Good. And I can get you the documents way, way ahead of time. Okay? Yes. I would prefer great. that if you don't mind. It's That'd be great. I think that works out for everybody. Okay. Good. Thank, okay. you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Are you amenable to that, Bailey? That's fine. Great. Thank you. Um, so no action. No action. Okay, great. I'll, put, I'll give you the documents on that. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we have Thank just you. one one more application. We have very limited time, um, and then we have one signed plan. So, Jackie, um, <clears> you're <throat> on with um, a very specific uh, Joe Gaza request. Jackie, there's Molly Gaza down there. Have we lost Jackie? Somewhat. She's on. Jackie, are you there? Well, in the meantime, can we acknowledge the signature of Larson Benedict, number 20? I just want to confer with Kathleen to make sure there's nothing uh, stopping us from doing this with the sale. This is I, Matthew, I would recommend waiting on that oh, until. Yeah. OK, thank you. Yeah, Chair yeah, Burke needs to confirm. Okay, so we take it off. We take that off the agenda, Madam okay. Chair. Take it off. Good, Jackie. Hi. Yes, sir. I you had a very short and small piece for this Gaza. Uh, yes. Um, let me share the screen. Give me one moment. All right. So this is the resolution. We um, can you see? The screen? A little small, <laughs> like six point type. Oh, really? Let me see. There you yeah. go. Is that better? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. And because it's like in PDF mode, I don't have all the nice capabilities I do when I'm um, at work. But um, so this is the Gaza map in blue. Um, this is the map um, where we are consi we considered and approved the abandonment on October 22nd for the road to come up here and cul-de-sac in this um, approximate location. This was the yeah. Schwank Gaza something, yeah. right, yeah. which we approved. Yes, you approved. And we have the, that resolution, which is highlighted in the areas that they would like to request to, sorry. Sorry, it's not letting me go past. <coughs> I'm not sure why it's not letting me keep going. So Jackie, just talk a little bit about what the, what they oh, want. Sorry. I was trying to get to this page. I'm sorry. The trail, right? Yes. Um, so let me see if I can. Okay. Okay. Now, sorry. It wasn't responding. Sorry. Um, so this shows it well. So these are the trails advisory board comments here. Um, they had originally asked for a 10 to 15 foot wide easement along the eastern side, which is in keeping with where we have the drainage and uh, grading easement. Um, the applicants were concerned that the easement along the side is going to be intersected by these driveways, which Joe Gaza has provided the blue. This is actually a document from Joe Gaza that has overlays from the Trails Advisory Board. 
Um, so what happens is that 10 to 15 foot wide easement would be along this side of the road. Um, they're concerned with the driveways and possible driveway gates, et cetera, um, you know, that that wouldn't be appropriate. So um, Mr. Gaza and Marla Schwank and Ken were opposed to this trail easement that we adopted as a condition of approval. Um, our main goal though is to try to get to the north. Um, this is town owned property here and then there's town owned property here. And although Split Rock Road is not a formal trail on the trails map, it is a historic trail that people hike. I mean, and Glorian is probably familiar with it. Um, it's not shown on our designated trails map because we don't have the connections to make it a formal trail to lead us to essentially where we want to go. Um, so with that, Split Rock Tho Road though is a very well established um, trail that was previously it's, used. It's I believe. probably an old woodlot road. Yeah, an old woodlot road. So people would go up into the moraine, cut some trees and then bring it back down to the village is my understanding. So um, with this road though, I mean, I've hiked it. It's very cool. It has an actual rock that it's named after that split. Um, so we're trying to achieve, this is our only parcel that is our only missing link. Um, so once we get this if CPF and this does not have road frontage and it's surrounded all by public land, as you can see here. Um, so essentially once this parcel is either preserved or possibly development rights lifted and dedicated, we would have a really nice split rock road trail link into possibly the Gaza property. This parcel is also a question, but if we gain access through here, which is a very important um, consideration that the Trails Advisory Board already asked for, and we already said that either this be a conservation easement, I mean, be a conservation easement and allow for a future trail. Um, and I wanted to give the owner obviously notice if we ever do have to reroute the trail, you know, to maybe come over like this to split rock to the tension lines, which are right here. Um, but basically the important aspect of this is the trails advisory board is willing to concede and not um, have the essentially that pink or red and ask that they just be allowed to walk within the right of way. Um, so that would be basically up the blue and then continue in the private right of way of the road and then the town owns within the map. So it's my understanding that the town as a public entity and members of the public can walk a private road as long as the town is an owner within that very map. Yeah. So that is the case. Uh, uh, if you could do as long as a few, the town owns the property, yeah. uh, any town person can walk to get to it, if that's the only way to get to it. Okay. We, we have a lot of issues like that in, in um, Shinnecock Hills. Okay, so, like so yes, I remember, um, you know, sitting with the Trails Advisory Board when we were trying to figure out links um, and where we could walk, et cetera. So my understanding is that essentially we have the right already to walk up Broadway in the yellow and continue in the private right of way. What we want to have as a map on the note is to have the ability to walk along the blue. So rather than walking on the private property, which is an easement, walk within the road, they were amenable to that, and then essentially continue up that private right of way, which we have, you know, entitlement to. Um, Joe's northern portion is one of those integral links that if we do never get this piece, we could essentially reroute either from here to Joe's or, you know, come down here and essentially avoid this, avoid this private property. Um, so really what the Trails Advisory Board wants to focus on is hopefully getting this as a conservation easement with the trail easement, which is what the existing condition is. They're willing to amend the resolution and basically take away that strip that I discussed. Um, and then there's another aspect of it where Joe would like to because of the concern for liability issues and having the public trail over private property, he wanted the board to consider a one lot waiver, which is pursuant to 292.44. We normally do it for open space preservation purposes, which because this is not a mapped line here, we would essentially draw this as a new line and then the development rights essentially from this would just be transferred to the Southern portion. It already has um, we've already approved this for full development rights, which we went over in October as well. Um, and then Joe was willing to dedicate this to the town. And so, that way there wouldn't be a liability issue because it wouldn't be privately held. It would, the liability issue would essentially transfer to the town. Um, so that's basically it in a nutshell. And there were some cleanup items regarding utilities um, and road plans that I'm comfortable with because 
when we originally approved this in 2008 with the planning board, um, we didn't have a road plan and we didn't have necessarily co uh, cooperating entities within the map. Now we do have cooperating entities. We do have a road plan. We're gonna require a road plan to be provided and to show where the utilities essentially are going. And we're just gonna ask that at least a, a note be added to the development section map, which I'll review um, and allow people to walk within the blue. Um, and then Joe would like you to see if you would consider doing the one lot waiver. Um, you know, So that way this could be essentially lopped off and it would be public. Um, and that's pretty much is one tied to the other? Um, well, you have the authority. You have the authority in two ninety two forty four to do the one lot subdivision. There's no submission requirements, but the requirement for that is that it's one lot that's being created, and the other lot is for a non for profit or public open space purposes. Well, he has lot eight. Are you saying he wants a lot above eight? He would like to lop this off and give this like green sage color to the town. So what's why is that a benefit aside from the from the liability issue? Does that mean that that extra land then becomes a development right to use somewhere else? No, but, no, no, it couldn't. No, this would essentially just be preserved. The credits that we've already sent to here essentially would just be landed. It's already landed essentially. Yeah. So um, the the only issue is really liability. He has the concern with liability. Marla and Ken have the concern with the public walking along the easement. Um, so, you know, the Trails Advisory Board, I think, are being reasonable. They're saying, okay, you know, with the grading and stability, we're not sure what kind of condition the shoulder is going to be in. We'll walk within that right of way. Um, you know, but if they're not amenable to, you know, walking in the pavement area, I had a little bit of a concern with abandoning the yellow, um, which I would like to give to Marla's lot. I don't have any problem with it, but I just want to make sure we ensure that public access going to the north, getting to the town owned land, and then hopefully providing for that future planned trail link that can come off here in some location. How are we ensuring this? Because that's, you know, I'm hearing, uh, how are you making sure this is actually going to happen? Well, so we would essentially what he's asking for is an amendment of the approval. We're going to ask the development section with OFA maps. The development section is very binding. That's the map that I would follow or my predecessor would follow in reviewing any applications to build. Um, we do have three property owners right now. They have essentially all the development rights for this map. So once that development section is approved, it would have a note that the public has the right to walk within the right of way. Can you show me um, where the walk the new walk. Uh, they would essentially walk up Edge of Woods Road and then come up here and right. then continue. So my only concern is as it deviates from the historic map road, this is the deviation that I'm concerned about. Yeah, but how does it get north? Um, that's uh, it goes all the way up here. This is a private. Um, I thought people. you didn't want to go on this. No, no, we do. We don't want to go on the red. We want essentially instead of the shoulder, the Trails Advisory Board wants to walk on the road. Which is which is the blue, the blue, and then up the private right away. Let me see if there's a, oh, sorry. So essentially his request is to have a little bit of a curved road here. So we'd be walking on the pavement, which is to be built. And then we would continue on the private right of way and then up here to the town owned land. And then this is town owned, I believe too. The lopping off of lot eight would be in this vicinity, and then that would be dedicated as a town. So that way we would have that future possibility of a trail link. So that lopping off of the <clears throat> by the line. Yep. Um, and he's transferring the development rights from the northern portion that he's giving to the town. Yeah, to I mean, essen essentially, we've already transferred. We've done that. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, in my eyes, it's not like he's double dipping and he's not going to use those rights anywhere else. Right. Um, this would be, he, you know, the mechanism I can talk more about. The that, if I can, Jackie, real quick, that's going basically from a conservation easement to now fee title to the land, Madam yeah. Chair. Yeah. Uh, to the town, rather. The town, right. Yeah. yeah. So right now, it's just fee title. Yeah, right now it's preserved, uh, you know, to be preserved no matter what by conservation easement, allowing for the ability of a future trail. But if we lop it off, we're essentially securing it as town dedicated land. And that way we have no... I understand. It, it, it helps split rock trail. I get it. Exactly. We all understand exactly. that. Yes. So, so what are we doing cool now? Rock. It's very large. It's a very large rock, yes. 
Um, um, so today I would be amenable to, I wanted to just bring these concepts to the board and I'd be amenable to write up an amended approval, which essentially would remove the requirement for the 10 to 15 foot easement. Um, ask for the note that we are allowed to walk within the pavement right of way to get to the Northern Town properties. And then I can add a be it resolved for the 292.44B, if you guys are comfortable with that, which would allow us to have a map um, be done that would lock this off. Mm -hmm. And essentially then this would be dedicated and this would remain privately owned. Uh, uh, yeah, ja Jackie, I would suggest that sure. when you talk about the paved part, talk about all of it. Um, even though we we know we have the legal right to do it, since we're putting in some language, let's mm -hmm. include both sections because there might be the, the it's that absence might encourage people to not let the trails people walk on it. Okay, and you know um, we had discussed possibly putting this in future deeds, but since old file maps really are bound by the development section map and the development section is really the town's development section map. So in preparing that map and when I review applications, even on maps that I haven't worked on, that is really what I go off of. So I'm looking at all the notes and all the configuration. So I'll have it properly noted and we can add a note essentially in the location you know, or like a, you know, an arrow to it. And then I'll also add like a note in the note section of the map, which, um, let me see, I'm just which basically will also outline it and reiterate it in detail. I'm just thinking of practicality. Somebody goes and buys one of these lots in a year, you know, at some time in the future. Mm -hmm. If it's not in the deed that shows the, or they can't readily search on a title search that comes up with an easement, that's going to get missed. Mm -hmm. The map note, you mean? I yeah. mean, Kathleen, is there? It's enough? on the map. It should. It'll be. It has to be on the uh, filed subdivision map as well. On the just, filed map. So any due diligence should capture it. Off I, the, um, I'm just thinking a normal title search. Yeah. Is not. I don't think it's going to bring up that that note. Yeah. So my only sure. concern is really this bottom portion where we've deviated from the private underlying paper road. Um, this is my concern, you know, Marla's lot is narrow down here. So, you know, in planning terms and build out, this would be fine to add to her lot. But this is truly, in, in my opinion, the public's access going straight north. You know, so the only other thing, Kathleen, which just came to me is, I mean, we could ask for a trail easement just under the roadbed. Um, as a possibility, so that it's just really here, because essentially, we have the right once you get to here. But they don't want the easement. That's the whole point of it. No, but not, not an easement on the shoulder, just an easement underlying the actual pavement where we're asking to walk, where the Trails Advisory Board is asking to walk. Sure, so, if, they're, if they're amenable to giving us that, that would accomplish Because that, that would only affect this lot rather than all four lots. Right. So um, why don't you ask them that, Jackie? Thank you. Oh, there you are. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I've been biting my tongue here. <laughs> First, uh, this is Joseph Gaza. Good afternoon, board members. Uh, Marla Schwenk and Ken Wright are watching, and Marla would like to participate. Marla, are you there also? Oh, yes. If she's not in, um, you can, Charles, please let in Marla and Ken Marla Wright. Schwenk. Marla, Marla, Marla Schwenk uh, has, uh, she has three of the lots. Ken Wright. Oh, Joey's are frozen. I don't see Marla. How do you see Ken Wright? No. On before, but. No. All right, you just froze, Joe. So if you were speaking, oh. just repeat. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, Marla Schwenk and Ken Wright are yeah. Uh, yeah. owners of uh, lots other than the, the four lots of Joe Gazza. There's eight lots in this subdivision. Right. Three are Marla's, one is Ken's. They all have a say because it's not just me that's it's, it's looking into this trail business. Uh, Marla wrote a, a rather lengthy letter to the board and I was hoping that she would have the opportunity to address the board regarding the trails. If we can't bring her up, I will, I, I read her letter and I will address her letter to mm -hmm. your, the board members. So I'll, I'll proceed in case Marla can't get on. 
The owners of the lots on the old filed map are not in favor of the trails going through our little development section. The, the trails that exist, the Split Rock Road Trail is to the north and it connects into the edge of Woods Road to the west of our property where the town has extensive holdings of, of acreage. I had a 10 acre piece that they've already bought from me. It's, it's hard for me to show on your map, but it's <laughs> to the west. And the, the Split Rock Road Trail connects the edge of Woods Road to the west. We don't want a new trail through our little old filed map subdivision. And I'll, I'll tell you the reasons why. Under old filed map law, there is no trail provision. The trail provision applies to subdivisions where you have open space areas, where you have a, a development and you're setting aside a certain percentage of the land to accommodate trails and features that the town wants to protect. Under old filed maps, that doesn't apply. I'm gonna tell you why. It's five acre zoning, we have eight lots. Our eight lots are on 12 acres. 28 acres has been preserved through development right transfer. All the land to the north, we preserved 28 acres for trails to get our eight lots. Our eight lots are not that big. They're only an acre apiece. When you put a trail down a paved road, initially you wanted to be on the, uh, the east side of the road, which was gonna cross four driveways. We, we don't want a trail in the middle of our lots. The lots are 140 feet wide. And those are the big ones down on the bottom, lot number five, Marla is only a hundred feet well, wide. Can I just ask a question? When we agreed the original, was it agreed to with these trails on it? No, no. The trails only came up at the last meeting when we asked to shorten the road Broadway from 900 feet to 450 feet. That's all we asked for. So, for, so just trying to understand. So the condition or the, what the condition was to get that change, they asked for the trails. Is that my that's, understanding? It was, that's correct. Okay, we so asked for a shorter road. They said we want now, Jackie had to present our application to all the departments. And now they said, now we want trails. Okay, so this other discussion is not relevant. The question is, can we make it a condition of granting that, the, getting the trails? Is that what I'm understanding? That's what it is? Uh, yes. Okay, so the other education on that is yeah. not necessary right now. We, we can and we have on other maps. You know, a lot of other maps, we've asked them to follow the right of way as well. And we've said, okay, this road can be abandoned subject to a trail easement because it also was a valuable trail link in that location. So we have- Remember the map about a month ago, the map in Eastport where they had that, that open space at the bottom and I was just free thinking and I said, why don't we put the trail? Why don't we put the trail, the public access, right down the middle of the flagpoles? And everyone once said, "What a terrible idea!" That's terrible. how is this different? I, I was I shocked, think, that, and I should have been. It was a terrible idea, but yeah. how is how is how is this different? Well, so, so what's the alternative here, Jackie? Right, I think what we need an alter from, alternative yeah. to the connectivity. If you're not going to do it this way, Where, where's where's the, the Jackie? You had um. You had the larger map of um, sort of an area map showing the different, do you still have that accessible? The tax map one? Yeah, it was. Uh, let me get to it. Sorry, my computer's it's on the left. It's on your. Um... So yeah. does the trails walk yeah, on the power line? So, so I have to admit, um, this is the Palm Monarch Trail. Right. We have no way to get down to this road currently. The only way comes down technically here and down there, but then we don't have anything in this vicinity, um, you know, to serve this area. We're asking, we essentially have the right to walk, you know, I'm sorry about it being in a sideways view, but essentially we have the right to walk within this thin blue and up to our town owned property. We're asking to just, instead of follow that blue, follow the road that's gonna be there. And then Split Rock Road, you can't see quite well here, but I believe it's in this vicinity 
snakes downward and then comes to this location, you know, comes around like here somewhere. Yeah, I think it's right here actually. Okay, so, you know, the one side of the argument is that this is a road that's going right through a small development with narrow lots. Not the best planning. On the other side, the trails need some connectivity. Is there an alternative here yeah. that we can look at? Is there any the power lines? That Jackie can walk with under the power lines? But we're, we're not we're not authorized to walk under the power lines. And also, you know, I discussed this with the Trails Advisory Board. It's not really desirable as well because you're walking under infrastructure. Okay. We're not seeming to be comfortable. Can we go back to the drawing board, go back to the trails advisory, Jackie? We're trying to make a decision. Well, that, that's what we did. So I told them Joe's opposition to the easement along the edge, and they were willing to concede and just ask, ask to walk within the pavement. They don't normally want to walk within the pavement, but this is an important link. So they said, okay, since they oppose the red, we'd be willing to walk within the blue and then continue up to town on property. Joe's portion is a little bit of a separate issue because this would be the rerouting of the trail to get Split Rock Road to connect further. Um, there is a problem and I don't know, I, I don't think LIPA really gives anyone the ability to walk within there. Or, sorry, PSD. We, have we should know across it, but no, no, nobody walks under it. Yeah. Um, if, and th this is more, more of a Kathleen question, um, if we if we have the right to walk on private right of ways to get to town owned property, then we have the right to do it, whether or not this applicant wants us to, uh, wants to allow us to. Yeah, it's a, it's within your discretion. I think you know. Ideally, you want to work with your applicants to make right. sure that. Right. Glory, that blue, look at the blue that blue appendage where it goes down to edge of woods road that's not that that's that's on private land this is but technically we have the right to walk in the yellow yeah you're proposed to convey that to marla right yes but i mean that was when we were getting the red trail easement so if we're not going to get the red trail easement why should we abandon the portion that we're allowed to walk in Can Can we can we just look at this more creatively and look for an alternative here? Um, I, I will happily take it back to the Trails Advisory Board and see if there's an alternative. Now, you, Gloria, and you said you never walk under power lines. How about next to power lines? We walk, right. we, cro we cross them. We don't have the right to actually put a trail under the power lines. Yeah, that on either side of the power line, is there a right of way on the other side of the power lines? Does anybody know that? I don't believe so. And this is private property, and then it continues to be private property. I mean, where the power lines are used for ATV activity, where the power line crosses roads and it gives the kids easy access. But the tra trails are not there. I, th I think we're considering the applicant's concerns and we're not going to be asking for this 10 to 15 foot wide easement along private property. Um, this is really the important aspect, but we do want the ability from a public road to get north to town owned property. And that's um, the only way to get from Edge of Woods? Is that the only way to get from Edge of Woods up to Split Rock? Um, when in my discussions with the Trails Advisory Board, yes, this was a very important link. I'll I'll bring it back. I'll bring it back to them again, though. I, I don't have the full trails map memorized, so um, we can look at that again and see if we we can review the overall picture. You know, we were looking at this and the important link. Um, and I do think the one lot waiver has merit because he will no longer have the liability issue and will have the ability to reroute the trail and go to town land. Yeah. Um, but we were hoping to have the ability to get down to Edge of Woods Road. Well, maybe you can go further along. You've got town owned land, town owned land, town owned land to swing split rock across. I don't believe there's any town land that comes down to Edge of Woods currently. There, there I'll, is. I'll, I'll look into it. Only, only further, further west. Further west. To further west, west. West of um, the Lipa line that crosses Edge of Woods. Right. Maybe nope. it's one of those times to just say no. I mean, so, I, I so support Mr. Gaza's objection to this. 
Well, the thing is we have an amendment where we all, we have a resolution where we already have the 10 and the 15 and the trail in the conservation easement. So we're, what we're looking at is, is the amendment. Jackie, why don't you go back to trails and tell them what the difficulty is here? And, and I just want, I, I would be happy to do that. And I just want to let the planning board know though, you know, as an old file map development section, you are the applicant. We are obviously taking into account all of their wants and needs, but I think this is a very important link um, and the trails advisory board agrees. Um, so they were able, they were willing to not walk on private property, walk within the right of way. And then they supported Mr. Gaza's efforts to take off the Northern portion so that Split Rock Road could be a public trail in the future. So we're trying to plan for an, in, you know, an important link to Split Rock Road. But what about further west? I'll ask them to look at that. Look, look at that. I'll look, ask them to look at that. Well, the, the only access is um, from Edge of Woods Road is further west. It's between Long Springs and the power lines. And- Do you have that on this map, Jackie? Can you show I, it? I don't think so. Let me see. And- um, It doesn't show where it outlets. It's somewhere here. Yep. <laughs> the town owns substantial lands to the west. And I believe that the Split Rock Road hits the power lines and it travels the edge of Woods Road to the west. That's, that's the trail. Oh, this and there's the, parking there. The town owns the land right out to edge of Woods Road. The, there's no the, parking at the end of our little street. Where are people going to park there and walk up our, a private road through a, a cluster development? It's, it just doesn't make sense to put a trail in, in eight clustered lots. We've already preserved 28 acres. We, that's that's our contribution. We preserve 28 acres to, to build on clustered lots. You're going to put a trail 40 feet away from houses. People on the trails, they want to walk through the woods. They don't want to walk on a paved road looking 40 feet away from someone's home or their pool or their deck. 40 feet is nothing. You can you can throw a, a baseball over 40 feet. And, and it's just not not a proper place for the trail to go through a development. Let it go through the woods. It winds around. It goes through the town-owned property. That's what trail people want. That's what we want. Joe, Joe I, I totally disagree with you. I can walk from my house onto the Pominock Path, and sections of it require me to go through little sections of developed, developed land with houses. And like literally the trail right near my house is abutting a tennis court fence. And it, it, but it allows me to get from, from south, from where I am in Southampton, almost to Montauk Point, if I had the energy to walk that far on trails. But they're, they're, they're pieced together with these little road pieces because land was developed before people did trails. Can we bring this back to the trail advisory with Joe, with Jackie, and see if there's an, what the alternative is that can make everybody happy? Because I can't do that from where I'm sitting right now. All right. So Jackie, why don't we leave it with you to discuss, maybe you and Glorian. And uh, we're going to have to really wrap it up because um, there's another meeting um, very shortly. So. Yeah. Thank you oh, for the time. Thank you. For oh, the there's time. no action. Yeah. Would it would it be inappropriate to have someone from Trails Advisory Board at our meeting to have a discussion? Well, I think we need to do some work before then, yeah. before we have you know to have some discussion with them separately. Yeah, I, then, I, I, you know, I agree. Going back a couple of alternative plans. Okay. We, we did in November, and that's what generated their second referral. But I would be happy to bring it back to them. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. So we um, we're done. So no action on this. No action on that. And we've come to the end. So I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion. Motion by Dennis, second by Robin. All in favor? Uh, six in favor, one absent. We are adjourned. Happy holidays. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy holidays, all.